Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure. We've got the entire panel here ready, and it looks like we're raring to go. Uh, that's the first time for a while I think we've had a, a full panel back. So it's I'm looking forward to this conversation tonight. Welcome to everybody in the chat room. And uh, let's say hello to the congregation. Let's start with Sister Lisa. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I am very grateful to be here tonight with everyone on the panel. Thank you so much again, Brother Luke, for having me. I'm excited to uh, hear everything that's going to be discussed this evening on the panel. And I'd like to say a warm hello to everyone in the chat. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sister. And uh, I know that everybody's uh, praying for you and your family uh, because of the loss of your grandmother. So I'm, I'm hoping that everybody is uh, okay. Yes, Brother Luke, thank you. Everybody is doing wonderfully. Um, we are excited. My grandmother was a believer, and she we know she's fellowshipping with my father right now, and probably mm. her mother and father and grandmother and grandfather, they believe is going way back. So uh, I think they're just having one wonderful family reunion right now. If I sound any way down, it's it's got nothing to do with that at all. So don't don't even be concerned about that. I'm not. I'm not at all sad. <laughs> all right. That's the way it should be. Isn't it wonderful when, when we can actually be joyous? I mean, obviously, we we are grief over the loss of being able to see them and be with them, and but uh, we can rejoice knowing knowing how uh, their, their eternal state is, is so wonderful. We can be jealous of them. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, how about Sister Angel? Want to say hi to the congregation? Hi, congregation. And yes, Sister Lisa, you know, I know um, I, I didn't lose my family members while I was a believer. Um, but um, uh, now that I am looking back, um, you know, almost all of them, I have just such peace knowing uh, exactly where they are. Um, and it's, it is really an amazing testament anytime an unbeliever sees that, how we can... Uh, really uh, be at peace uh, knowing uh, that, <laughs> that they're better off than we are and knowing that, not just hoping it, not just wishing it, not just uh, wishful thinking, but actually truly knowing that in our hearts. So um, I think it's, hard, it's really hard for uh, an unbeliever to fathom that or even believe it when they see it. But um, it's, all, it's one of our most important, uh, I think, like our witnesses uh, to the, the, the truth of the Bible and that, you know, the, the truth of our faith. Uh, when we really have that, we really, uh, we show that, uh, that, that we really believe what we say we believe. And if we do, um, we have peace and we lose, we, we lose a, a, a believing loved one. So, but uh, it's great to be here tonight, guys. And um, I got a kind of interesting question lined up, I think. So can't wait to get started. Okay. Well, you got me my curiosity peak. Uh, how about Sister Paula? <laughs> I just want to say real quick, Angel's kids in the background are so funny. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Good to be here. It's good to see everybody on the panel and everybody in the chat. I'm looking forward to the true-false statements tonight and uh, looking forward to our fellowship. Mm -hmm. All right. Amen. And Brother Cripps. Yeah, um, it's going to be another fun Fellowship Friday, and I hope everyone had a good week, and getting ready for the weekend. And um, I'm glad everyone is here. That's awesome. And I uh, want to say to uh, Lisa, I know exactly how you feel. Uh, I, I um, And this is in no way a comparison of grief or anything like that, but uh, it just so happened that I lost my mother, who I was very close to, and uh, uh about three months before that, I lost my grandfather, who was also a believer, and then a year later, my uh, grandmother, uh, all, all on my dad's side. So it was it was a lot. It was a lot to, to um, uh, deal with. But um, what I found fascinating is that the Holy Spirit uh, worked in me and in a way never before or since. I've never felt anything like that. Um, so I pray the same uh, for you as you uh, deal with all, all that, because it's still a loss. 
Um, mm-hmm. But I, I know that she's in a better place. I love the way you said she's fellowshipping with uh, your other uh, relatives. That's that's such a comfort uh, to those of us that are uh, left behind and, and have to wait to uh, celebrate with them once we get to glory. So that's that's a ama- uh, is an amazing witness. I agree with what Angel said. So anyway, uh, hello to everyone in the chat. And uh, um, uh, like Paul, I'm looking forward to the true and false questions and to the fellowship. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, Brother Ben, uh, there were some people on the chat room. One said it's uh, buffering, and another said there's no sound. But that's been a while, so maybe that's not a problem any longer. But maybe you want to confirm that everything's okay. Yes, it's, it looks okay on my end. Uh, I think that might have been an early report, and I do apologize. I am doing something slightly different. Um, I'm doing a simultaneous backup, so it is really taxing my computer to the extreme. Um, but I, I twiddled some bits and it seems to be better. So hopefully we're, we're okay. If, if worst case scenario, we'll have a perfect, pristine offline copy that I can upload later. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, it would be helpful to everybody if you could elaborate a little bit more about what you're, you've done and this backup and what, uh, you know, the benefit of that for everybody. Well, I don't think, okay. Um, probably only people like me, and I'm probably the only person who really cares, but um, uh, the, the the streamed, uh, the stream is always recorded at 1080p, 60 frames per second, which is, which is, you know, nearly every, which is very, pretty, pretty decent, really great. I mean, that most, most programs are done in 1080p. Um, but a, a couple of problems with, is, with that is, um, well, first of all, I, I'm a technical person, so I like to have 4K. And so I'm backing up into 4K, so it's better quality. Uh, that's one nice thing. I'm al- also, too, is that if we have any hiccups during the, the stream, uh, we'll have a pristine copy offline that I can upload um, later on. So it's good for that purpose. And then also it gives me an automatic backup. So, um, you know, there's been times where the streams has gone down, either YouTube errors or my internet connection problems, whatever reason. Um, the some of the video is lost. Well, that will not happen now because I'll have an offline copy uh, that so that will never happen. And then also um, there's been top times, especially lately, and everyone's been complaining about this, is that if it, it, sometimes it takes YouTube uh, days to finally process your video. So even now after this live stream, I bet you it's going to be 12. As soon as this live stream ends, it'll probably be 12 hours later or eight to 12 hours later before you actually see it pop up in your subscriptions feed. Um, you can you might be able to search and hunt and peck for it, but it won't show up in your subscriptions feed. And then also too, if you want to make any edits to any of the video whatsoever, um, YouTube is taking like three days for, for them to process those changes. So it, this allows me to circumvent that whole process and say, okay, you know, YouTube, I'm like waiting for three days. I can upload a better copy and get that up in, in an hour or less. So, that's that if anyone cares. Sure. Okay. Um, may I interject something, please? I just have to. And that is that, Brother Ben, I got to scold you on something. Get him. You're self-deprecating. And I don't know if you know that you're doing it. You do it a lot, brother. And I want to bring it to your attention. Everything you just said was absolutely interesting. Maybe not to everyone, but to some people. I don't care if it's one other person. I just learned something by listening to you. And you you do this a lot. You excuse the things that you have to say as though they're not relative or important. Uh, And and brother, I love you. Stop doing that, please. You are valuable and precious to the body of Christ. There is nobody like you. You add unique flavor to everything every discussion we have and, and promise you if you do that again i'm gonna jump through the screen and pop, pop you okay <laughs> amen right. amen amen that's right yeah. oh that's wonderful yeah. I think yeah, right. yeah, ben. I agree. Yeah. you're Thank so you. fascinating ben you don't even realize that you have such interesting insight into everything and you you act like you <laughs> like you're boring people when you speak I, I i you're such a great addition to the panel i think well, thank you, everyone. I'm just uh, not used to that at all. I'm used to being mm-hmm. uh, looked down upon, and the, you know, look, you know, you know, how the world looks at Christians and just people, people like us in general. So I, I apologize. I don't mean to. Uh, I, I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to stop. Well, I, I know that, um, 
such a Lisa's observation and comment, I, I've noticed that myself, and I, I can dare say anything like, publicly like that. We, I've talked to you privately about how you're, uh, you know, um, you, you should have more confidence. You're, you're, you, you have an excellent uh, talents and abilities, and and so I've said the same kind of thing. But Sister Lisa saw that. Hey, let's let's everybody acknowledge and, and make settle this once and for all. No need, no need for you to uh, be worry about these things and, and just have confidence. Uh, the, let me ask you though. Um, when I saw that there were two uploads of the same thing, I thought it was a, a, a an issue and you said well that's, it's actually good because they have a choice could you explain why that's a, a valuable and beneficial to have the the two and now apparently the program is going to be two uploads uh, a duplicate well that's true and, and that if there is this pro, it's pro it has a pro and con it, there's pros and cons to it one is it maybe it leads to confusion uh why is there two copies but i mean uh i don't think it's that big of a deal frankly that's just my opinion uh and it gives the ability for people who have 4k tvs and things like that just get a better quality uh, version of it. And the version I upload typically will be available within uh, an hour or less after the broadcast, whereas the stream might not be available for 12 hours or, or later. So if it does cause uh, um, too much confusion, um, I can I can uh, hide one of them. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, but, oh, uh, the other thing is um, the live streamed version of it will have the full chat, the, the chat replay, whereas the recorded version, all you're going to see is the, the chat that's, that's published to the screen, uh, which is generally all the chat. But, um, you know, if you want to get every little titty bitty, uh, itty bitty piece of the chat that you're going to want to watch the live stream version of it. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll put it to a vote. If it's too confusing, I can uh, remove it, but I like having the 4k version personally for myself. Well, let's give it a, uh, some time. And after a little yep. time, we can we can discuss it again and give everybody's feedback on it. Um, but um, the the only thing I can see is that the the, uh, the number of viewers, the total viewership, would be split between the two yes. videos. But yes. that's not really an issue. We're not here so concerned about total number of views anyway. So I, I, that wouldn't be an issue for me. Um, all right. Um, anything else on these preliminary things before we get into the uh, the program? I'm ready for the fun. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I've that was fun for me. <laughs> okay. I'm sweating. <laughs> You're sweating. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, uh, brother Ben, uh, why don't you give us the first true false statement? Okay. First true false statement is: if a saint believes a doctrinal error, God will bring bring correction. So again, if a saint believes a doctrinal error, God will bring correction. Mm. Hmm. Great Very question. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, I want to go first. I want to think about this. So let's uh, see who would like to go first on this. Who's eager? I'm eager. I'm, I'm eager. Go ahead. Um, I I think yes. I I think that 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 is true. Um. Uh, especially a doctrine that's damaging. I mean, is there one that's not? Maybe. Maybe there's a, a slightly off part that's not a big deal. Um, uh, for instance, um, well, I, just to throw one out there, when the rapture is going to come. I mean, I know there are some things that affect a person if they uh, b believe that Christ is coming at a certain time. But would God correct that person? Uh, I don't know, but there, uh, there are some doctrines out there that I believe that if, if it is a saved believer and not a false convert, I believe that uh, they would be corrected. It, it may take two decades. I don't know. I mean, we don't know the timing of God for sure, but I do believe that a true believer, someone that really believes the, the, the right gospel, but they have a different doctrine. I believe God would correct them. The Holy Spirit would work on them, just like he would work on anything if they were living in repetitive sin. I believe the Holy Spirit would uh, correct them in that area. Um, again, could be something with certain people that take a lot of time to weed out of their life. Uh, for most people, it's not instantaneous. Um, so, yeah, I would say certainly true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, brother. Okay, Sister Paula, what do you say? 
Um, I also voted certainly true. Uh, however, the the timing of when God will reveal this error to the saint uh, is up for debate. Because I think in the end, I think that we will know like the full truth. You know how that part mm -hmm. says, um, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Mm -hmm. So we'll see Christ will be, you know, in his presence. And I think um, when we're that close to truth, that we're actually living with truth and there's no more even potential for sin or error or anything like that, I think that all these doctrinal things will be cleared up. I think that they could be cleared up sooner than that if we went to God humbly and asked him like, am I wrong about this? You know, um, that's what I like to do because I don't have a, um, you know, some people with, especially ones that have a, a workspace gospel, a lot of the time they have is what I would call pet, pet verses because they have a particular doctrine that they're holding to. So for instance, um, you can't get far in a conversation with a Calvinist without them bringing up Calvinist doctrines, right? So it's their pet thing. They like to keep going back to it. Um, but I think we had a broadcast when we said uh, a while back about, I don't remember what the statement was, but I was saying like, I think that God would allow us to be in error because um, the fruit of that is actually going to be greater than if we know the truth at the time. But then there's also other factors, like maybe we need to learn A, B, and C before we can even understand D. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Um, it's how it builds. But I also think maybe we can... Um, hold maybe a, a someone in higher regard than we even realize that we are. So say our favorite preacher or something has always said something that's always made sense to us and we have scripture to back it up, but maybe it's off a little bit and maybe we've never gone to God and asked them, is this off a little bit? Because we don't want to think that, you know, this guy might have deceived us when in fact, maybe he was just mistaken because we are only human. But I think such a certainly yes, because I think at some point we will all know, you know, we'll be all perfect in our doctrine. But when that occurs might be a little different for everybody for a variety of reasons. But at some point, yes, I think will all be corrected in our doctrine by God. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, very good. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. That settles it. <laughs> <laughs> really, that's how much I liked your answer. Uh, okay, go ahead, Sister Angel. Oh, by the way, Ben, you didn't say who wrote, the, who submitted the question, so I don't know who to go last. Well, Paula, this is... Paula, this is what your friends uh, questioned. I don't know if you want to uh, recognize that or not. Oh, well, as long as they're not on the panel, I just wanted to, if, if it's one of the panelists, then we always let them go last. Okay. Is, is, that's the only reason I need, needed to know. But if you wanted to tell us, Paula, you can. Oh, well, I mean, it's not my questions. I don't think that she has a problem with it. It's Autumn. She's in the chat right now. And um, I was like, we had sent, she had sent her, uh, statements to Ben, I think over a week ago, but then told me she wasn't going to be able to be here last week. So he put them off for today. And I think Autumn, if you're listening, he said earlier that maybe we'll only get to half of them because he has other questions in the queue. Um, but yeah, they're great questions. I don't think she has a problem with anybody knowing uh, cat's out of the bag now, <laughs> but, okay. but I really like her to be able to also respond. And while I'm here, I'll tell, I was going to type it in the chat, but Autumn, if you go to uh, the true false statements and you click it right underneath that, you can write a comment 
And uh, the comment doesn't tell us it's from you. So just put your name at the back of it and tell us what you, how you would answer that. Yeah, very good. Tina. Thank you, Autumn. Uh, that was an excellent question. So we'd like to you know, recognize that. Okay. Um, well, let me see. We, we were just getting Sister Angel's answer before I interrupted, right? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit undecided on the, you know, really on the answer to this because um, it, it, I, it kind of goes even to the, to the issue uh, that I know not all of us agree completely on as to whether somebody could um, fall away from the, even the true gospel. Um, I have, uh, you know, have a lot of questions uh, regarding uh, how, how, you know, far into error uh, God will allow a true believer to go. Um, because uh, for a while, um, I would have said 100% absolutely. I, I wouldn't think that, a, like, for instance, that a, a truly saved believer could ever um, fall away into believing a false gospel, like, wholeheartedly. But, um, you know, some people have brought up some uh, counterpoints to that uh, recently. It's, uh, you know, uh, I think ben, ben is one of them. You know, he pointed out some things that, you know, maybe question that a little bit and maybe maybe think maybe I was kind of taking too hard a line on that. So um, that kind of rolls into this question for me because I don't really know now. Uh, I, I get sometimes it's uh, it, it was a little bit easier, uh, uh, you know, feeling really certain that uh, that somebody who had been, you know, uh, truly born again would not, um, you know, really take up the mantle of a false gospel afterward and, and really go into heresy, but um, uh, I will say that when it comes to like lesser, as you know, non-essential issues, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't necessarily believe it's a, it's like what Paula said, there's a, it's a timing thing, you know, because eventually, yes, God will correct all of our errors um, when we're face to face with him and we'll understand in full, but um, I'm, you know, I, I can think of plenty of people that I, I truly believe, uh, they, they knew the Lord, they believed 100% that, uh, that you know, Christ died for them and that uh, they had eternal life uh, because uh, he rose again. Um, and um, they had a lot of uh, things that I would consider doctrinal errors or things that, you know, they wouldn't even have known how to contend if, if some people had brought up certain questions. They wouldn't have really known, you know, my father, he's alive today and there's certain things that, uh, you know, even when I was an unbeliever, you know, he believes through and through. I mean, he is, he is a born again believer, but he doesn't have an answer for everything because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't study all the different doctrinal ins and outs uh, as much as we do. And um, so, you know, he, that's almost even worse than being a doctrinal error in a way, because it's just, he's in doctrinal ignorance about certain things. He just doesn't, uh, he wouldn't really know how to contend for it, but he knows what he believes. He knows what the gospel is. So I can't say for sure that uh, God will always correct uh, to where we're, 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 by the time we die, we are, you know, 100% correct in our, in our doctrinal understandings. I think um, uh, the one thing, obviously, uh, we have to get right at least once is, is what saves. Um, but yeah, so I really don't know. I'm interested in hearing other people's point of view, because this is a question that torments me all the time. Because when I'm trying to figure out, uh, like, you know, somebody that I come across that, uh, you know, claims to be a believer, um, either they're in some type of what I consider heresy or um, or they don't seem to really take a strong stand on what I consider, you know, essential things like eternal security. And I'm always trying to figure out, are they or aren't they? And to me, this question is just another way of asking that, because what, you know, would God allow a, a true believer to be in really major doctrinal error? So, yeah, I really... Uh, uh, I'm open to, to, to you know, to, to hearing everybody else's answers because this is something that bothers me all the time. Uh, I don't know how wrong a, a believer can be, uh, and I don't know, I don't know how long God will let them continue being that wrong, or you know, like I said with my father, just you know, ignorant of certain things. Um, I know in my case, he has given me a very strong passion to seek out the truth, and um, and to get my doctrine correct, and ha be curious about these things. But I don't, I don't notice that that is the case with everybody that's a believer all right thank you sister all right well maybe by the time you're finished here uh you'll some of your questions will be uh settled uh sister lisa what do you say 
Once again, could you just repeat the question for me so I can... I heard it, and I heard everybody's answers, but I just want to refresh the question. Right. Ben, would you read it again? Sure. If a saint believes a doctrinal error, God will bring correction. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about that when Sister Paula was talking, um, and she said that, well, yeah, I mean, like she was saying, A, B, C, D, maybe you needed to have errors one or A, B, C to get it right on D or finally get it right dealing with D. So, you know, I would say, uh, uh, yes, certainly he would. I mean, if you look at the scripture, for example, where the Bible says, I would not have you to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Mm. That's a desire, but it's not always the case. <laughs> so even the things that uh, the enemy uh, or people who mean you ill mean for bad the lord can turn it around for good for our good in his glory so if a person has a doctrinal issue but their heart is right towards the lord meaning they really do want the truth they just don't have it right now i believe that they're they're seeking the lord and they're listening and that's the other thing i always say you know what do you do with the truth when you find it you know hebrews admonishes when you hear his voice hard not your heart so that's the other part of it. Uh, when he shows you the truth, will you listen? Will you hearken? Um, but I believe absolutely he doesn't want us in darkness. Uh, he'll use it if if need be to uh, expose us to what is needed to refine us, to shape in us, to help us grow. So uh, the Lord will lead us and guide us and direct us. But the thing is, what one has to be careful prayerful, tenderhearted, is to be able to repent, which is to change your mind when you see that you are in error and humble yourself. And unfortunately, sadly, there's a lot of people, particularly if they married, <laughs> married themselves to a doctrine and publicly pronounced, announced, drew a line in the sand, then they, they have trouble coming back and going, you know, I've rethought that and I've changed my mind about it. Uh, I'm always worried of people I don't find doing that who have not reconsidered. I'm not saying they should reconsider everything. I mean, there's certain core doctrines that we're we're 100 percent about. But when it comes to other things that are not the core doctrine and you do discover that, well, this can't be true because and you search it out and you search it out and you search it out and you determine according to the scripture and the leading of the Holy Spirit, that this was indeed error, and you you should repent. It, you know, so I, I am impressed when preachers do come forward and say, hey, I changed my yeah. mind about that, and here's why. Yeah. And then they explain it, for at least for you to consider, even if you don't change your mind about it. Mm -hmm. There are preachers I listen to absolutely don't believe in the rapture. They believe it's a Catholic doctrine and a lie. But they're right on a bunch of other stuff. So I, I listen to them, but I don't agree with them on that. So, uh, you know, I don't attack people just because they don't believe in a particular doctrine I necessarily believe in. I may ask them pointed questions as to how did you arrive at that? And when they tell me if I see something, I think, well, well, did you consider this? What What's your answer on this point of that consideration? And, and I wait for their answer. Sometimes they answer me. Sometimes they don't. But, you know, I don't go then make an ex <laughs> expose video on them and stuff like that i don't know it's a lot of weird stuff out here in youtube world but uh i don't think it's a uh, stuff that we should even be squabbing over fighting over just point out the doctrine where you think the error is you don't have to attack anybody necessarily personally and just keep it moving because anybody who's paying attention to what the tenets of a particular doctrine are is going to know well i listen to this person and they talk about this kind of stuff so even though you may not have mentioned their name I see what you're saying about this particular doctrine, because after all, all we're getting at is the truth. I'm not the truth. You're not the truth. <laughs> Jesus is the truth. So his word is true. So it's OK if we misstep along the way. But I think we need to be honest if we have put something out there and, and taught it or whatever, then we should come back and make that public correction if we did it publicly. Hmm. 
Wow. Amen. Agreed. Uh, yeah, I would say. I that, agree with that. If, if there was anything lacking in uh, Sister Paula's answer, uh, it was completed by Sister Lisa's answer. So we, I think it's, we covered everything there. It's very, very uh, good points by both of you. Uh, let me see. I, a lot of things I want to say, I'll be re kind of repeating uh, the points that have been made. So let's go, let uh, Ben go next, though. Okay. Um, okay, so, yeah, I think we all know that there's multitudes of people that say, uh, I believe the Bible. Okay, well, great. Well, what, what do you believe the Bible? What, what other do you understand? Um, that's a whole other matter to get all together. Uh, and a lot of people, when you really, uh, you know, uh, put the microscope on them, you find that they're just their statements of faith are full of hypocrisy, where they'll say, I, I believe everything in the Bible is true. And then, you know, they'll say they'll argue that John 316 uh, doesn't actually need what it says. Or, you know, they'll always have a, an escape clause uh, to support their uh, false doctrine. Um, I believe absolutely. Uh, I'm 100 percent on this. I mean, this is something I, I'm convinced I've studied. Well, that for me personally, this is something I've studied ad nauseum because I wanted to be uh, uh, absolutely correct on it and have my uh, understanding complete. And I, I believe personally that God has shown shown me that I'm approved on this matter. And, and, and my, it's not a matter of, of it, I, I believe to you show yourself approved is that can your interpretation, does it harmonize with all of Scripture? And do you can you find parallels where other verses serve as a witness to that correct interpretation? And I believe, uh, again, with on the, on this particular matter, um, any believer uh, can fall into error, serious error, even unbelief, even to the point where they're renouncing their faith. Um, I believe a born again believer can happen. That can happen. Yes, I agree that it's very difficult to understand or believe it yourself. But the Bi what does the Bible say? But most people, I find, they they rely on their doctrines uh, too much on so, on their own subjective experience, and not on the objective truth of Scripture. You know, the Bible is there to teach us things that we couldn't otherwise know through through experience. That the Bible talks about things that are invisible, hidden truths, um, and so it's crucial that we use our 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 understanding and our doctrines come from Scripture itself. And I believe, you know. Uh, whoever seeks finds and a lot of people they will seek 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 and they'll finally get the right gospel which is great that's the first step that's the most important step but they stop seeking after that they say okay i got i, I won the game or whatever uh i don't really care about anything else i don't really care about rewards i just i just want to i just want to make sure i don't go to hell you know um but i i believe that if people really want to know these things uh we don't need to pray to god even to say god show me where i'm in doctrinal error um, I mean, that's fine to do, but I think his answer is always going to come in the sense of, have you not read my book? Have you not read my word? Because I've given you all the answers. It's just up to us to go out and, and, and search and dig and sift through the through scripture to find the right interpretation. Um, in fact, I, again, absolutely convinced uh, people can try to make uh, use all kinds of sophistry and experience to refute this. But I'm absolutely convinced, just speaking for myself, that Galatians, 2 Peter 2, Jude, Hebrews are all warnings. In fact, I believe all the epistles are written to believers. The audience, if they're talking about someone, is talking to believers. Only occasionally will they refer to unbelievers. It's very crystal clear they're talking about unbelievers. They use different titles like sons of disobedience, etc. But too many people will read those books and say, oh, well, this sounds like it's unbeliever, so I'm going to apply this verse to an unbeliever. And I, I'm gonna, this must be applied to, to believers. And they get that perseverance uh, doctrine, which is, Really, just repackaged Calvinism, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, I, you know, it's it's it, I, I, again. I'm absolutely convinced. If you read Scripture, you know, no Scripture is a private interpretation. Scri all Scripture is God breathed, and is prof profitable for doctrine, for reproach, uh, and for uh, uh, and for uh, instruction in righteousness. And so, again, uh, I'm absolutely convinced. Anyone who doesn't have a, Try to read their own theology into it, but that's the eisegesis. But if you use exegesis, they, if you carefully uh, study Galatians, Second Peter, Jude, Hebrews, are warnings to born again believers of falling away in, into some kind of error. Uh, absolutely convinced of that. Any anyone who dis argues against that, I think they're arguing again on, on experience, and they're being the arbiter of what statement or what verse applies to unbelievers and believers. 
Um, and I, I think I can make a solid case for that. And uh, I, I, I'm working on that right now, actually, because I, I proved these things out beyond a shadow of doubt for myself. But now I need to go back and start making these points and uh, this instruction available to others if they're interested in understanding where I'm coming from. Um, and it also, I think it's also other things too, too. You know, if, if you take a lot of those verses in Galatians, 2 Peter, Jude, et cetera, and you apply those to unbelievers, well, you're missing the point because God, the, the author of those books are warning the congregation, watch out, let's, let's watch out for each other. Let's make sure that no one drifts away. And and um, that's what we're supposed to be doing. But if, if, if we suspect that someone who drifts away in error is, was never born again, well, then we're going to be very suspicious of everyone else. We're not going to trust them. All oh, it must not have been a born again believer. We're not going really to do probably a whole lot, take a whole lot of effort into trying to convert them back into uh, correct them. Um, and uh, so uh, I, again, I believe that God will bring correction, but I think He already has brought the correction. It's in His full, the full revealed truth of His Word, and it's there to find uh, for us to find it. So there's really no excuse for anyone to be in, in false doctrine for you know to persist in it. And to, um, you know, when they're approached with a right interpretation, when they can back it up with scripture, uh, I, I don't think there's really any excuse to be in, in false doctrine about some things. But I, I, I'm sure that I hold the, some false doctrine. I'm sure, you know, some minor thing I'm probably incorrect about. Um, God forbid it's something major. But um, again, I, I just don't think, you know, some people say, well, oh, well, yeah, a damnable doctrine, uh, God will keep you from uh, uh, avoiding slipping into but minor doc man minor false doctrine god will not well why would god allow some truth allow you to not fall into some error but uh fall into other error it's like saying you know why does god let you like a, a true born again believer it's really no different in my mind if someone's saying uh, a true born again believer will not uh commit adultery but he can lie it's like well why would god why would god uh allow certain sin uh to occur in a believer's life, but not other sin. It, it doesn't make any sense to me, and I don't think there's any uh, scriptural basis for it either. So that's my answer. <laughs> All right. I, I'll say amen to that. I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, now, a, a lot of ground has been covered, uh, so I'll try not to be too redundant, but uh, I answer the question. By the way, Ben, uh, I don't remember in your answer if you said how you answered the question. Uh, I, 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 well, I put leaning true in the sense that, um, you know, I, I believe the, the answer is already there. Uh, it's God will, God, if you want to know, God will lead you through scripture and his word to find the answer. It's not like it's going to pop in your head. I don't think he's going to say, yes, the rapture is true. You know, anything like that. I think he's going to show you the scripture. And so that you can be convinced of, you know, one way or another. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so that I can really have the absolute context here. Uh, would you read the uh, true false statement one more time? Yes. If a saint believes a doctrinal error, God will bring correction. Okay. God will bring correction. Uh, that, that's a declaration of an absolute. And I personally, I uh, have an aversion to uh, saying yes. Um, um, uh, unless it's so explicit in the scriptures, then, then I'll say, I can say, yeah, I, absolutely, 100% all the time. Uh, so I answer the question leaning true. I think it's probably true, uh, but not absolutely true all the time that people are going to be corrected with their doctrine by God. Uh, and, and then, of course, even if God does correct, uh, it, it, I think it was um, Lisa who talked about how we responded to to the, the spirit uh, trying to guide us into the truth. Uh, we don't all respond the same way. Um, it's like when Jesus was asked, well, why are you confusing everybody? And he's speaking in these parables. Nobody understands what you mean. And he says he didn't want them to understand. He purposely was speaking that way. He didn't want them to understand and, and believe because they weren't ready. Their heart, they had a heart issue. Their heart was not ready. And uh, so um, maybe even though and this question is supposed to be uh, directed to someone who's a believer, so someone is a believer, they've got the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean that even though we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we do not become perfect people. <laughs> Matter of fact, some of the most imperfect, horrible people I've met are, are, are believers. And um, so that doesn't, 
doesn't mean that uh, every Christian that's truly saved is going to have this heart attitude where they desire to really want to know the truth. They could resist it just like they resist everything else the Holy Spirit is trying to teach them. Uh, I, I've said that uh, many times, you get probably get tired of me saying it, but the, the problem in Christendom is 90% of it is works gospel. Uh, it's not the real gospel. But of the 10% that have believed the real gospel, the real church, the, the biggest problem in the real church today is dogmatism. And that's where people think that they've got the answer uh, absolutely correct. And there, and there can be no disagreement. You have to agree or else. Now, we've all embraced the idea that in this congregation that we will have, I'll say, four dogmas. Uh, the deity of Christ, faith alone for salvation, eternal security, and the fourth dogma is you must never impose a fourth dogma. <laughs> okay? You must have liberty on everything else. If someone tries to come in and, and say, well, this, we all have to agree on this fourth point. No, there's not a fourth point of agreement. But if you talk to most Christians, if they have taken their Christianity and their Bible study seriously, and I've seen this happen over and over again, generally it takes maybe a year or more, sometimes even sooner. But the, uh, a, a babe in Christ starts getting serious about the scriptures and starts learning some things and coming to some conclusions. And all of a sudden, they've got a fourth dogma, a fifth dogma, a sixth dogma. And when I say dogma, I'm saying, if you don't agree with them on that position, then you're a damnable heretic and they will shun you and, and, and call you a false teacher. So um, uh, that's what happens because we are imperfect saints. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ, but we still remain imperfect. Um, they, so as far as um, um, when it, I'm thinking the doctrine, if someone's a Christian, uh, they got the, the gospel right. Okay, otherwise they wouldn't be a Christian unless they, and I really have been as correct, sometimes people really believe the simple gospel message and somehow they get fall into apostasy or they have a crisis of faith. I believe this does happen. Uh, but um, I'm talking about a person who uh, believes correctly and, and always has. What about the other minor doctrines? There's a hundred other theological subjects. Uh, do all of them rise to the same level of importance? I would say no. I, I'd say that there's, I would probably rank them all, in, like, let's say from one to 10, one being not important, very, very important at all, that you get that right, to 10, well, that's an essential. And as I said, there's there's three essentials, and I would say there's there's really two things that you have to get right in the Bible, and that is who is Jesus and how you get saved. Apart from that, you could be wrong about everything, and, uh, and that it's not really uh, much damage done except your lack of understanding. Um, so, uh, hmm. I guess I covered everything that uh, I know I probably repeated some of the same points, but uh, let's see if anybody wants to respond. Uh, oh, yeah, so I, to, to sum it up, I, I would say that if, um, if a person has the right attitude, and I don't see this attitude very often, unfortunately, and that is uh, the willingness to listen to the opposing views. I don't meet very many people who not only are willing to hear someone out, but seek out opposing views. Uh, on all the other theological subjects, have you ever taken the time to say, well, you know, the position that I hold, uh, I wonder if there's other viewpoints. Uh, maybe I should look at search, research this and, and, uh, and consider that maybe there's other positions and maybe I could be wrong. Not very many people have that attitude and that's that's disappointing to, to me but uh of all the people who do take the time uh, many of them do not have this the, the attitude that uh they're willing to uh, admit they're wrong and and, and change may right. i comment on that yes go ahead when you're done yeah i'm, I'm done um 
I, I just I, I can identify with that because I used to and I've uh, many people have heard me talk about this and it, it's just ridiculous when I look back at it and see w- what a young buck I was and and uh, thought that I uh, knew everything and was uh, so arrogant but um, God did correct me uh, so it does tie into the question uh, made me teachable and and uh, I'm so grateful for that because, I, first of all, I don't want to be arrogant. I don't want to come across, and, and and it wasn't like a seething arrogance, but it, I was still arrogant about uh, my knowledge of the Bible and what it meant to be a believer, and and there just there were things that I didn't understand fully. Um, and, but by His grace, He did correct me in that area. He did not allow me to continue in that. Uh, and and made me teachable. And brother Luke, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, I see you as as being uh, uh, teachable, even at your age and your uh, all the study that you've done. I, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours of study that I I'm I'm uh, sure that you have done. Um, you're still teachable. I, I've heard you on more than one occasions. Uh, more than one occasion. More than one occasion. Uh, tell us about how you uh, changed uh, uh, the Lord led you to um, move away from a, a past teaching and you, and you even uh, would talk about it publicly. So um, I, I think that a, that a believer, a true believer should have that attitude. When they don't, it's a real concern to me when I see someone that confesses Christ, but yet uh, they're dogmatic about so many things and, and they don't seem teachable at all. Um, I would ask for rebuke if I was ever that way. I, I would ask for my fellow brothers and sisters to to bring it to my attention and say, hey, you know, I think that your your attitude is is going the wrong direction and, and it doesn't seem like you're teachable. It seems like you think you know everything. And I, I think that makes me a fool if I if I'm like that. That's all. I just want to add to that. I I agree with what you're saying. All right, thank you. Um well the independent study I've done uh, that that has resulted in me changing my mind. Uh, that's definitely a lot of time was invested in that. But I can tell you that uh, in these group discussions, this Friday nights, um, uh, Wednesday nights, I know that uh, there are times you could probably also, if you thought about it, you can you can recall that during a discussion, one of us will say. Uh, well, I started off with this position, but after hearing everybody out, I'm changing my position right before our eyes, right? Uh, you know, as uh, live in person, there's a, a, a change, a change of mind because a person has an open mind and is actually listening. Yeah. Listening and considering. Yeah. Amen. All right. Is there any more on this from anybody before we move to the next uh, question? Um, I just want to add one little thing. Um, the other thing, too, is that a lot of times people will say, oh, well, certain doctrines God will not allow you to fall into error. And usually those doctrines are related to a person's salvation. Well, what if there's an what if there's, what if there's a doctrinal error that's an affront to God's character? Like, so, say, for example, someone – this is not a great example. I can't think of a good one right now. Uh, but say, for example, Trinitarianism. Someone denied that. I don't believe that's a salvation issue. It depends on what they're – to say you know they believe in modalism or whatever i don't ne- i don't believe that's necessarily depending on their understanding a salvation issue but what's more what's more important to god your salvation or his character i think his character is probably more important to him um yet again i don't think anyone's going to argue that uh that uh that someone who falls to that kind of error after post salvation indicates that they were never saved uh, whereas if they stopped believing, well, then they, that must have meant that they, they were not saved to begin with. Um, again, okay, uh, that's all I was going to say. Are you guys ready for the next? Oh, I'll read the comments. How about that? Yeah, I could do that. Okay. Okay. The first person says, "But will they listen when he does?" That's a great. It's a great question. I think Crips hit on that expertly. Um, and, and God forbid, I, I hope I don't become that way myself. Um, Amen. I, I, the, if I, the only conv- argument I'm I've, uh, convinced by is if I would read Scripture. And again, if I could show myself approved by finding Scripture that has other witnesses can, that can back up that interpretation. Because um, again, it, no Scripture is a private interpretation. you got to use the Bible to interpret itself. Um, next person says, uh, 
Oh, <laughs> I think it's French. Uh, maybe we need Angel for this one. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that it's ooey dooey. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Don't I try. Don't, don't try. <laughs> okay. Do you see oh, it? Okay. Oh no. Okay. I, I, Anyone can open up the comments. I believe that's the name of the channel. O U D C. Sorry, well, I was just, having a hard time unmuting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it looks like O D C, but it's really hard to pronounce it anyway. Even like, even because D C is like le letters. It, it's, but O is it's O U in French. Well, actually, well, one, well, one of the uh, answers or one of the comments was is in is in French. It says we. Oui. I'll put it in chat. You guys yeah, let's put it in chat. Okay, yeah, go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, someone we need an interpreter. We need a tongue speaker. Um, a tongue interpreter. Okay, so oh. here we go. Next question is, I'll just skip it. I'll skip that and give you a minute or whoever can speak French to translate that. The next person says, different opinions and interpretations may apply, but so does free will. Correction could come personally or from others. That's a good point. Number four. Um, okay, Angel. Uh, Sorry, I, I haven't seen it in the chat yet. Okay, uh, okay. The uh, next one is following John MacArthur is a punishment waiting to happen from God. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, kind of in, in a weird way. Okay, number five is the Holy Spirit works in you. That's from Laura Stubbs, and that's certainly true. And then number six says Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Dooby-Doo. I don't know. Someone's taking advantage of being anonymous there. <laughs> um, the the comment says um, uh, basically yes, God will always correct our beliefs. Okay, cool. That's my re my rough translation. Uh, haven't I haven't had anybody speak French with in years? But uh, but I'm pretty yeah. That's basically what it says. Well, the fact uh, that you can even who, get who's that. speaking the French here? Oh, so, yeah. Think. It's O U D C. I think. I oh, okay, oh, that is a French. You did. Two years? I did. I in school. That's I chose that instead of Spanish, which made no Me sense. Me too. Even no, my parents no, were like, practical. "Why are you doing that?" I was like, uh, "You know." I was tired of Spanish, man. I had it all, yeah. all my elementary school and middle school, but yeah. then I never learned it. But I didn't learn French until I took four years of it. But it, it didn't until my um, third year when I realized that my friend Justine, she spoke French. She was half French. And so when I finally had someone to speak French with, then I learned French. But I was, you know, it, it, it's you've like impossible. The, you, you've got the translation in the chat room from J. Rain 28. She says, yes, God will always correct all who believe. That's Google Translate. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Okay, so all who believe are our beliefs. Yeah, yes, I, I yeah. Okay. So correct. The thing that, uh, I, the thing that I uh, didn't hear in in any of the um, uh, comments uh, or from the panel here is uh, uh, any verses that would if you if you're saying absolutely, let's say certainly true. Uh, if we say certainly true, I have to ask. Okay, then there must be a scripture that is clearly stating that. Otherwise, how could you be say so certain of it? Uh, so I didn't see any any of these positions backed up by uh, some scripture that were actually stating this. So if you can come up with some scripture, I'd love to hear that. All right. Uh, shall we go to the next question, anyone? Ben? I'm ready when you are. Go ahead. Okay, the next question is, true or false? Proof that the God of the Bible is evil is that he required the Jews to subject their newborns to torture by circumcision. <laughs> That's an easy, quick one. All right, Crips, you're gung-ho. Go ahead. Well, it's certainly false. I mean, I mean, that doesn't prove that he's evil at all. Uh, he requires certain things that might be uh, painful, but, I mean, I was circumcised. I have no memory of it. So it, it wasn't traumatic uh, uh, enough to... You know, have, carry carry the uh, re memory of that around. I don't think it's. I mean, it may seem brutal to some people, for sure. I mean, they may think that it's it's brutal. God did a lot of things that we don't understand. I mean, you hear atheists go on and on about the slaughter of other groups of people, and, and that's that's their keystone. That's the thing that they focus on when they're uh, talking to uh, people that confess Christianity. Uh, going to all the verses in in scripture that uh, talk about these uh, 
uh, uh, homicides. That's not that's not the right word. I, I can't think of the word that means uh, killing off of a, a, a large group of people. Um, you know, wipe it out. You know, wipe wipe them out. Even kill the the, the children. That seems horrific to us. Um, genocide. Genocide. Thank you. I just couldn't. I couldn't draw the word up in my mind there, Ben. Um, so yeah, f- to a non-believer who doesn't have any understanding of God that looks at that and doesn't believe in the first place, that that may seem like a horrible thing. But in each instance in His Word where He commanded something like that. We know, as believers who've studied his word, we know that he has reasons for that. No, I, I don't see, and there's other people too, I don't want to draw this out too long, there's other people that 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 uh, come to the conclusion that God is evil, otherwise evil wouldn't exist. Why did God have to create evil? If he knew that Lucifer was going to uh, gonna turn that way, why did he create him in the first place if he's all-knowing? So he knowingly allowed evil to enter the world. And it, that in and of itself is a is a complete misunderstanding of God's purposes. Maybe we don't understand everything, but I do understand that He is not evil at all. He is nothing but good, no doubt about it. In my mind, I just said certainly true. Mm-hmm. All right, let me go second because my answer is going to be so short. Uh, um, obviously, uh, I, I can't accept anything that uh, any. Um, whether it's circumcision or anything else that uh, makes God evil. The, because part of the definition of what God is, is it, evil is not in the definition. It's the opposite. He's not evil. That's the definition of God. Not evil, rather, he is love. Uh, love, mercy, uh, and justice. Uh, um, these are the, uh, the qualities of, of God. So um, it, it can't be. There, there, if there is some kind of a like eternal torment, uh, I've often argued that the belief in eternal torment uh, uh, does not conform to the character and nature of God. And that's, apart from many scriptures, that's one of the main reasons that I, I reject it. Um, Calvinism, they're teaching against uh, that man does not have free will, that God is a hyper sovereign. He controls everything we do, and, and to the, even to the extent that if someone murders, God is making them murder. If someone rapes, God is making them rape. So um, that uh, these viewpoints here turn God into a monster, and that's why I would reject them. So how does circumcision enter into this? Well, um, I, I believe that there are some, particularly uh, in ancient times, there are some good health reasons. A lot of things done in, in uh, the laws of Moses, they were not done just because God is trying to make you jump through a lot of hoops and make life difficult. Uh, they're done because they're health practices, hygiene, and so on. Uh, and I believe that there are some benefits hy- hygienically for the circumcision, uh, but uh the interesting fact about this that uh, uh, I learned many years ago uh, is that the Bible says that the circumcision must be done on the eighth day of life. Uh, and now science has discovered that the height of the uh, body's ability to um, um, coagulate, uh, what is it? Um, uh, maybe it's vitamin K or, or something. There, there's something in the, in the blood that is at its peak on the eighth day that blood allows the bleeding to stop. So uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, it's specified. Why the eighth day? Why not the first day, second day? Why not the tenth day? It specifically says the eighth day, and now science confirms the eighth day is, is the most advantageous ideal time to do it. So these kinds of things make me uh, say that these are proofs that the Bible is the word of God rather than proof that God is evil. All right. Uh, who wants to go next? I will. Okay. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, you stole my thunder, Brother Luke, so I'm, just, I'm <laughs> letting you know. <laughs> I, I have proof, though, <laughs> because I answered the, uh, the question and put that in the comment about one, uh, no, of course, well, personally, it was certainly false. And two, that um, it 
was a confirmation of a of the covenant promise, uh, even though it is it's a foreshadowing of uh, the covenant uh, later on prophesied in Jeremiah thirty one thirty one and reiterated again in Hebrews, but also that it was a demonstration of the foreknowledge of God that He was indeed the one true and most high because of the fact that he specifically said that they had to circumcise the male child on the eighth day. And on the eighth day, the blood coagulates. So it was a witness to uh, his foreknowledge. And it was how many centuries before that was even discovered. So um, that was uh, what I was saying about how he stole my thunder on it. But hey, great minds think alike. So no, no problem on there. Um, and then uh, again, uh, even even what well, that is an, an astonishing thing in itself. But the covenant that is the the um, it was a foreshadowing of the outward sign of an inward change, much like um, water baptism. See, um, people make this mistake and make water baptism about salvation, but it's not. It's it is a testimony that you are a believer, but it is, it is not what saves you. And it's the faith that saves you, as Hebrews 11 points out. And this is one of the mistakes and errors if you wanted to show fatal error in doctrine. It is believing that works save. And you remember later on, Paul repudiates this, that this circumcision is not proof of salvation, that the covenant is based on faith in Christ. So uh, we see that they fell into that error that later had to be corrected, even by Christ himself when he addressed and he told them, I know that you are Abraham's seed, yet you still seek to kill me <laughs> because you are of your father, the devil. And what makes people either of the devil or of the faith, the dividing line, is the doctrine they believe. And we are of the circumcision of faith. So that, that's all I had to say on that. Okay, thank you, sister. Well, I'm glad I, I spoke before you, so I got to get credit for making that point before you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see. Paula, how about you? What do you have to say? Well, uh, it's a strange question. It's a weird thing to point to, to as proof that God is evil, circumcision. I mean, I've heard other people point to other parts of Scripture to prove that God is evil. But you could say, you know, proof that the world is evil is that they require your newborns to be tortured by getting vaccines. Um, you can say the same thing about the world, but the whole circumcision thing, I mean, like Jason said, he doesn't remember. I'm sure right. every man on earth doesn't remember, but I'd like to point out that Abraham was 99 when he was circumcised. Genesis 17, 24, and Abraham was 90, 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Foreskin and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in flesh of his foreskin. So the point of the circumcision wasn't to cause torture. Um, at this point of Abraham's life, probably wasn't for cleanliness reasons, although that is a benefit. It was a symbol of the circumcision of the heart. It was a physical representation of a spiritual happening when someone is reconciled to God through their belief through their faith you, you get circumcised in the heart and if you think about it it's we were trying to we were discussing it in a bible study one day like what does that mean it's a the act of cutting off a piece of the flesh and that flesh is tossed aside and it's dead um, there's something more there that the lord hasn't shown me yet but there's something greater to the symbolic act of circumcision. Um, but it certainly wasn't torture. I mean, in fact, if you remember the story about uh, the 12 sons of um, Isaac, remember their sister Dinah was defiled and the guy was in love with her and her brothers were like, yeah, well, if you're going to be part of our, you know, clan, you got to get circumcised. 
And so all the, he, the guy circumcised himself, his whole village circumcised himself. And while they were healing, Dinah's brothers went in there and killed everybody, which was wrong. But the point being, these were grown men that were taken upon themselves to circumcise themselves. And in fact, even before uh, Joshua went into the promised land, in Joshua 5, 2, it says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circus circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now, I don't think they were doing a circumcision on top of another circumcision, but this was after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and all the grown-ups had died within that 40 years because God said when they didn't want to go into the promised land 40 years prior, he said, Your children who you said to me, oh, our children are going to die in the wilderness. He's like, they're the ones that are going to go into the promised land. And all of you are going to die except for Caleb and Joshua. So these were grown men getting circumcised. It's certainly not torture. Um, so certainly false was my answer. Sorry, I didn't mean to get excited. <laughs> it's just a, it's a weird thing to point to and say that it's torture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very good. And I, I've always been fascinated by that account of how they required them to get circumcised so that they would be weakened and not be able to fight and they could destroy them. That was uh, quite a quite an interesting strategy. I think it was actually pretty evil if you think about it, because they they used this ritual, this physical symbolic thing that was representative of something spiritual. That was the connection between God and man, this, this physical representation of something spiritual. And they used it in a wicked way to, well, to disable the men. If, if I remember correctly, um, the, the, uh, Jacob's uh, sons did this uh, without his knowledge. And they, uh, it was not what he, he had not agreed to that. Right. He, he rebuked them after that. Yeah. yeah. If I could interject something real quick. Yes, go ahead. On that note, uh, that would be an example of how the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Just because you see things in the scripture where people do things, you yep. see that the Lord gave them no such instruction. That was something they took upon themselves to do. Yep. And yep. then, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and then I had one other point on um, the circumcision the circumcision of the heart, the, the uh, new the new covenant. Um, uh, I can't reiterate enough that this is very, very important because the person who formulated this question uh, that, you know, this is evil in the new covenant, there is no such commandment. So a man, if he is not circumcised, he, he does not bear this burden. So under the new and better covenant, this is an example of the Lord's uh, character and nature. There was a purpose and a time for it in times past, but now in the new covenant, there is no such commandment. So, what would your what would your answer be to that? If you're accusing, and I'm not saying they were, but if that was an accusation against the Lord, what would you say now under the new covenant when there's no such commandment? I'm just curious. I'm just wondering. Maybe they should think about that. Thank, thank you, sister. Uh, I tried to give you credit, but I messed it up. I made a comment. <laughs> sister Kisa. <laughs> it's, a, it's a typo. Uh -huh. I mean, sister Lisa. Remember when you said everything in the Bible is truly stated, but everything in the Bible is not a statement of truth? Sister. You just was trying to rename me without my permission. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, you know, Jacob changed to Israel, so now you're Su Suster Kista. Suster Kista. That sounds like a good <laughs> band name. It's Suster. Or is he creating his own language there? Suster Kista. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, your, your point you were making, it reminded me of that uh, truism. I, I added this to our list of truisms, by the way, so it's, it's a very important thing for people to understand that not everything in the Bible is... Um, a statement of truth, but it's truly stated. Okay, let me see who hasn't answered this one yet. I think uh, probably I haven't. I think I think just be an angel, right? An angel, you didn't answer, did you? Uh, I was my question, so uh, I. Okay, I then I was... you go, and then we'll let Angel go last. Then. Okay. 
um, you guys made a lot of good points and most made most of my points already. So um, a couple things is that, you know, these the type of objections about this practice in, in the Old Testament um, usually comes from atheists or those uh, who deny spiritual realities. And I find it, uh, you know, ironic because the fact that they're so deeply concerned about their earthly members of, of themselves or anyone else is deeply spiritual in and of itself, that they would be so concerned about the preservation of this, uh, this fold of skin on their bodies. Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, circumcised as a, as a infant. I'm not sure. I think basically the day I was born, I guess, I don't have any recollection of it whatsoever. Um, I don't, my son was circumcised. I don't have any recollection of him undergoing any discomfort or I'm sure it was discomforting, but it, I'm sure something the infant mind cannot process. And it's probably over before they even realize it. Um, but yes, uh, say, um, God did uh, prescribe it for uh, Abraham. Um, and also, too, my, my dad is not circumcised. And I know periodically he's had complications uh, related to that fact. I, I mean, he could probably go into detail, but I know he's had problems. Um, and I know there are people that try to espouse the uh, different uh, benefits of not being circumcised. And I, I think a lot of them are kind of a little far-fetched. There's not really any good real proof of, of it being any benefit at all um but i do find it interesting that the, you know any male will tell you that that part of the body is the most sensitive and in the same way um in the same way uh you know uh it's a picture of being circumcised of the heart and when you're circumcised of the heart your heart becomes more sensitive you become more compassionate you become more tender-hearted so it's very much a spiritual picture uh, or, or a type for a spiritual reality that occurs when you believe, um, and it's also the instrument through which life is conceived. Um, and in the same way, a heartfelt belief in the gospel, it at least brings it, uh, uh, brings eternal life. So just like the earthly instrument brought, uh, was that was a component in, uh, the, the first birth, the, uh, the, the heart felt belief brings eternal life and it's conceived in the heart. Um, but again, I, I, even even on a practical level, I just I, I, I'm thankful that I was circumcised. Um, and uh, also, too, is that um, I think, in, uh, you know, one of the early pictures you see in the Bible where it says uh, it's an Exodus, I think, chapter four, starting with verse 24. And it says, uh, and it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Um then Zip, Zipporah, his, this is, this is Moses' his wife, took a sharp stone, and sharp stone, huh? <laughs> that sounds a little painful, uh, and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it, and the word cast it is actually, it's literal, literally says, made it touch Moses' feet and said to Moses, surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. So God let him go after uh, he, he was obedient with that command to circumcise his children. Um, and then she said, you are a, a bridegroom of blood because of circumcision. And I think it's interesting that she, she circumcised her son and he threw it, threw it at his feet. And to me, I saw a parallel, um, for example, uh, in, in uh, Genesis where, um, fair, uh, Joseph, before he revealed himself to his brothers said to, uh, his brothers that they had to bring his, his, his full brother, uh, Benjamin to him and when he said that he said unless your brother is with me you will not see my face uh and I, again I see that picture of of uh, of Christ we, you know unless we have the body of Christ either you know on us or carrying his body with us essentially as our as our sin bearer we will not see God's face um and and, and when she threw that the the uh the foreskin at most of his feet I think that's kind of a picture as well like God here here here's my first birth here's my Here's the sacrifice. Um, also, too, is that I know a lot of times when I'm um, feel feeling um, uh, laid down by sin, I have to the way I, I, I kind of break free of that and start kind of reset, like reset myself and get put in the spirit. It's just I feel like I'm, I'm shaking off the flesh. Like it, I internally, I just feel like the, my flesh is, it, is it, the flesh. It, it is itself a picture of the foreskin. And, it, and I just you know, I see it collapsing at my feet, like my body's unzipping essentially. And now my old self is uh, on the ground and I'm walking out of it in, in the spirit. 
And so again, I, I kind of saw that parallel there too. And scripture kind of backs this up because it says in Ephesians 2, 14, it says, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might re, uh, might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting uh, the death to uh, death, the en enmity. So again, uh, again, I, th I see the, the circumcision as a picture of our flesh. We must be circumf circumcised in the flesh because the flesh is evil and we need to be born again. Um, and so we, we need to be clean from it in God's sight. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, th I think. Yeah, and, okay. And so also too, a, a, a uncircumcised heart is kind of like a, a picture of the, a stony heart that's um, that's kind of governed by the law law principle. Um, whereas you know, I'm only going to do this for you if you do it to me, and I can exchange. For example, it's always you know, it's nothing out of pure love. It's always uh, it, it's out of uh, self selfishness essentially. And then a new heart is based on selflessness. And again, the the it, that's a picture of uh, the flesh uh, laying aside your flesh, forsaking your flesh for any that has any merit at all. Our flesh is evil. Um, so I guess you guys took, took my uh, thunder. <laughs> so good hmm. job. Okay, thank you. I, I'm i hoping maybe you'll send me some of those mushrooms that you've been eating, brother. Me too. I think I had some mushrooms like that back in the 70s. <laughs> back when I lived in Florida, by the way, is where I, went, where I got them. How did I miss the joke on the mushrooms? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, that vision or dream or something, the hallucination he had, which I think he must have been had some mushrooms for that. Oh. Well, this this is an example of how Ben should never uh, do that whole thing I was scolding him about because after we pretty much said a, a bunch of wonderful things, and even though Brother Luke stole my thunder, uh, <laughs> Ben managed to come up with a bunch of points that we didn't touch on. So, you know, that was actually wonderful, very, 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 very wonderful, Brother Ben. And I really do appreciate that. You touched on a number of things that I had never considered concerning this topic. And I thank you for that. Yeah, so, right. I, I did want to say one more thing. Uh, another thing the atheists, I think, also bring up is that this is a, a, a Jewish practice today. Maybe it was back then, too. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't see it, see it prescribed, and prescribed by God in Scripture at all. But the Jewish priests after he circumcised it will sometimes suck the blood off of it. Yeah. And I, I don't know why that that's is. not in scripture. Yeah, that yeah, that's not in scripture. Uh -huh. but I, think I know they, why that is. They I, I think they assume that it is, and I'm sure there's all kinds of spiritual uh significance around it. But I, one thing I will say, uh, even if it was in scripture, I do know that the spit, the saliva does have uh healing capabilities. Um yeah. again. Why they suck it off? I mean, that's that's a different matter altogether. Um, but I think that's why it's held against, uh, you know, that, that's something that Satan uses, I believe, to come against us. Yeah, because especially because some children have actually died uh, in New York from um, acquiring herpes that way. It's hmm. uh, it newborns. Yeah, it's not just one. This has happened multiple times, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that is a good point, um, and I, I, it is not in scripture. But, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I heard something about that not too long ago, and I thought somebody was making it up, but the rabbis—that's part of their uh, ritual. Uh, the rabbi boil. Yeah, yeah. So Ben, you're confirming that, huh? That's how they actually do that. Yeah. Talmud, huh? They have a they have a little hand crank now, but it's like a modern thing that they have a device that they can use to to do that instead. But in, but but traditionally they have used their mouths, which uh, really kind of takes the whole. Like oh, sometimes the accusation is that oh how hypocritical of Christians to be against paganism and uh, they say they're against Satanism and all the and you know ritual and stuff that circumcision is like this blood sex magic ritual that's one of the uh charges they make but that's like a jewish practice now with all of that uh that weirdness that they do they added on to it so mm -hmm. okay 
Uh, all right. So, uh, oh, it was, my it was your question? Go ahead, Angel. Yes. So, um, yeah, I asked the question because I wanted us to touch on it because a lot of people are talking about this right now, and you know, even a lot of people that are Christian or like they are quasi Christian, claim to be Christian, like they'll run their mouths about circumcision, forgetting that it was prescribed in the Old Testament. So, like. They're, you know what I mean? And like, they'll talk about how evil it is as if it was a, like a, like a Jewish thing, like the Jews totally invented it. But so I, I thought it was important to have a nuanced discussion on, on um, the fact that no, it is, it is biblical, but um, you know, and, 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 you know, we should be slandering God, but it is a mystery. So uh, obviously false, you know, God, it does not prove God is evil. But um, one thing that is really important that I've just found out is that, what we call circumcision today was not what they did back then. Uh, back then, in biblical times, this this was uh, um, up until like the Hellenistic period. Um, circumcision was like a very minor procedure where only the excess um, uh, little uh, tip of the skin that would protrude over the glands of the penis was 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 cut. Now, what I, I can't even say the word. It's like something that starts with a P. What they what they do now. Um, where they remove the entire foreskin and, reme and re reveal the actual glands of the penis is, is totally unbiblical. That is not circumcision. That's, that is much more radical, much more invasive, um, uh, and uh, probably much more traumatic and painful for a baby than, than what was prescribed in Scripture, what was, was understood to be circumcision at the time. Um, and um, I think it's... Uh, you know, that's mind blowing because I, I, you know, but it makes sense too. you, you know, really it, it makes a lot more sense, you know, considering like what Zipporah did. I don't know how she could have done that, done a modern circumcision as we know it today with a sharpened stone. Um, uh, that's a, because, it, it, you know, there's a mucous membrane involved in everything uh, when, when, you know, with a modern circumcision. Um, but so that. First of all, that should allay a lot of unbelievers' fears right there, because God was not actually prescribing what 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 we call circumcision today. But secondly, um, you know, it, every, a lot of people touched on it. But, you know, the fact that it was on the eighth day. First of all, that tells you that you know whatever God, if, if God's gonna, um, if, if God's gonna command something of his of his people, uh, especially something to be done to children who you know are don't actually have a say in the matter. Um, he's not going to allow it to be traumatic and painful just as he knew on the eighth day. That's when the clotting factor is up over like a hundred percent in, in their blood. The only day it's not like from then on it's that way. It's just that day, that one day it, they won't bleed to death from having this, this kind of procedure performed. Um, it also tells you that it had to be divinely instructed because how would anybody have known that they would have had to go through a lot of trial and error to figure that out. Um, because uh, most likely the children would have bled to death. Um, and all, like I said, after the eighth day, it's not like the clotting factor remains at that level. It's just on that day um, that, that, that it, it's safe to perform uh, circumcision. Um, so uh, that, you know, that, that right there is just one of those things that uh, really blows your mind if, you know, as an atheist looking at this. But um, um, I think that there's definitely a mystery in all of this. Uh, I think one, for one thing, it's a major uh, leap of faith and act of faith to do this to your to, to yourself, <laughs> let alone to your to your newborn. Um, and I think that um, you know, it, it kind of you know you know reminds me of uh, of Abraham and Isaac because uh, we it, it's kind of hard to even understand. Like, so why that? Why circumcision? Why? Why are you trying to get in my business like that, Lord? <laughs> it was kind of awkward. But if you're a believer and you trust God and you know, gosh, you, no problem. You want me to cut off my newborn foreskin? Got it. Done. <laughs> Already there. You, you know, if that, if that, if that, if God was actually, you know, um, uh, commanding that at you, if you have faith. Now, we are not commanded to do this at all. Um, the Bible doesn't even actually talk about any health benefits. Uh, and in fact, Paul refers to it as a, like, you know, mutilation. Um, it, it, I, and people think, well, how could something that is bad or, you know, not, not, not beneficial, why would God, why would God um, demand that of anybody, even just in the Old Testament? Well, see, the Old Testament, like I tried to tell God, it's, see, atheists always think they've like, you know, it's like some gotcha uh, moment when they point out how brutal 
and ugly and harsh a lot of the conditions and commands were in the Old Testament. As if they, you know, you know, God didn't know that. As if, uh, as if that wasn't the entire point. Um, and that's one of the things that I, uh, you know, that, that really was a big revelation for me is that, you know, if God had made the conditions um, under the law somehow uh, uh, agreeable or pleasant or, you know, even, um, you know, inviting I mean, people, there would have never been any reason where like the law would have, you know, stopped our mouths. Um, you know, everything that, you know, we see in, in the Old Testament, I look at as kind of, um, this is the God you get if you are trying to be justified by law. And it's, it's an impossible standard. It's exacting. It's harsh. It is not, you know, it's not warm and fuzzy, not soft around the edges, uh, because you can never, you can never earn, uh, God's love that way. And I believe that, that this is, um, that the, the reason the old Testament and people what call people call the old Testament God, it's a, it's a different God, uh, you know, presents this way is, is intentional because we're supposed to see the juxtaposition between law and grace. And um, including, yeah, even down to circumcision. Um, but I guarantee that there is some type of symbolic, uh, spiritual uh, principle involved in circumcision that I, I, I'm praying one day it'll hit me. That will just totally click into place and I'll be like, oh man, and I'll be able to tell everybody and, and people will actually see it. Um, but, um, but I know it's there because God doesn't do anything. Uh, that, you know, doesn't have some perfect symmetry, some perfect symbolic symmetry that, you know, we just have yet to uncover, as we have done in so many other cases, you know, even with, uh, uh, you know, how Jason and his observation about the moon faces uh, looking like the, uh, the tombstone uh, being rolled away from Christ's tomb, uh, that I believe there's something like that in circumcision that we just, you know, that I think is a very deeply buried mystery um, uh, because, I think God, for some reason, he intended it that way. Um, but uh, I'm sure it's going to blow our minds once we finally realize what it was. And, you know, maybe that's not going to be until the other, we're on the other side of glory. But, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I, huh? Oh, I just agree. I said, mm -hmm. sorry, I should have made it more clear if I'm going to interrupt. Uh, oh, no, bro, no, bro. no, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I just wasn't sure. I heard, I thought maybe I was hearing things. Um, nope. So, you know, I, I, I'm actually hoping to clip this part of the, the panel discussion and put it on my channel because um, I have some, you know, honest, uh, you know, babes in Christ and stuff that I've, you know, been talking to that they have a real problem with this circumcision thing. Right. And they just want to understand how they can kind of make peace with it uh, and, you know, not be, um, you know, because sometimes, uh, sometimes when a believer doesn't have an answer besides, well, I don't know, it doesn't make sense, but I just know because, because I trust God, you know, for a babe or a seeker, sometimes that's just, uh, not quite enough because that they sure. feel like they have a real opposition to a subject. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, like, especially in this whole movement now where there's like this whole thing against circumcision. And I, I'm not saying now, like I said, what we do today is not actually biblical circumcision anyway, not even close. So um, I'm not defending the practice at all, but there's a movement against it. Um, and a lot of, see, and, it, and it's, it's just how Satan would do things because the procedure that we have come to know as circumcision was never prescribed by God anyway. But now Satan has kind of low key uh, slandered God by um, uh, get, making us all believe that circumcision is the complete removal of the foreskin, uh, exposing the glands of the penis, which also, uh, you know, heavily disturbs the, the, um, uh, the frenulum, uh, the very sensitive nerve ending area of the, of the penis, which is, you know, some could say you're in a way uh, sexually mutilated for, for life from that procedure. Uh, you know, you probably would never know any different unless you hadn't been circumcised in the first place. You, you know, what, know what to compare it to. But the point is, is that uh, he pulled a switcheroo, Satan did, to where now uh, people can, uh, uh, who, you know, who are aghast at this procedure that we do today, um, you know, that we kind of just do unquestioningly. Most people don't even really know why they do it. Um, uh, and, you know, because even in the New Testament, you know, we're not, we're told that we don't have to do it. So it's weird that we continue to do it. Um, but it's not even the Bible, the biblically prescribed procedure, you know, at all. And now uh, people who have a problem with it, you know, uh, this is one way to harden uh, maybe people that are, are not quite believers yet against the Bible because they're like, well, gosh, you know, the Old Testament, let's see how many awful things did God tell them to do. And 
not to mention, you know, cut off the foreskin of newborn babies um, and uh, in their minds thinking the procedure that we know of today. So um, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I'm glad that I, I, I looked that up right as we were talking and, and to find out if, if it was, because I was trying to figure out if there's ever an exact procedure put forth in scripture. I haven't found one. Um, um, and that was confusing to me because it's such an extreme procedure. Um, and then when I realized, when I found out that it was actually just the minor little, like, um, like I said, the, the, the protruding bit of flesh over the glance of the penis, that that's what circumcision was then totally different scenario. I understand why there didn't have to be a long drawn out description of it in scripture. It was kind of, you know, self-explanatory. Whereas what we know today is a complicated procedure. Um, and I didn't see how there wouldn't be like God wouldn't have seen fit to lay out exactly how to do it um, in, in scripture. But um, anyway, uh, so false. And I hope I hope that uh, some of what we said tonight, you know, might uh, might help some people understand. But most importantly, if we know God and we trust God, just as Abraham trusted God, that if he, you know, uh, if he uh, sacrificed his son, if, his, if God told him to, you know, to take his son's life and sacrifice him, it, 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 you know, there, he didn't doubt God's character for a second. He knew God could raise him up the very next moment if need be, but he wouldn't be asking if it wasn't for his benefit somehow, or if, you know, if it wasn't for the, for the, the ultimate good. And when you truly um, know God and you have, you know, experienced God and had this relationship with him, I mean, um, you know that there are things that might be a little bit above your pay grade, but uh, but it's not. One thing I know for sure is that it, you know it's not a it's not a ritual of uh, meant to torment a newborn baby. Uh, just like uh, you know, God, there, I'm sure there's a lot more little nuggets that we're not even aware of yet about just like the blood clotting factor that we just don't know uh, as to you know maybe like newborn psychology and like how you know how their pain centers work. Um, that you know at least according to the actual definition of, you know, what, what, what circumcision was uh, biblically, which was like a very minor thing, which somehow uh, God knew that it wouldn't have this negative impact on, on, on newborns. Whereas now some people claim that, you know, it traumatizes uh, uh, male children, you know, males for life uh, subconsciously somehow, um, you know, uh, I guess they still can't anesthetize, you know, a, a newborn baby. So it is done without painkillers as far as I know. I'm not, positive on that but um uh i'm sure that the procedure nowadays i could see that but um but uh, i'm sure that god would you know he saw fit that exactly on the day that, that you know if you were to perform that you know procedure to, uh, you know to your, your your infant on that very day just as he told you i'm somehow everything would be okay i don't believe that he uh he would ever tell us to do something that would harm innocent baby children so um yeah but uh if anybody has any more to add um, I'd like to hear what the comments are, if anybody uh, had any other insights. Yeah, yeah. I'll read those. Um, one one other thing that occurred to me, um, and Angel, I would recommend you go back and listen to our answers. I think we all said pretty mind-blowing things. I mean, I think yeah. uh, across two of what we all said, I think we pretty much, I think yeah. they're mind-blowing spiritual things. Um, one yeah. of the things that may, may be, uh, that may be interesting, I don't know, it is the eighth day, you know, and it's it's like uh, you do it on the eighth day, so it's a picture of the new birth. Uh, I believe, you know, uh, the eternal uh, birth where you, where you have eternal life and, you know, eight, turn it up, turn it sideways, affinity uh, or uh, etern eternity. I'm not sure if that's uh, some kind of correlation there. Um, you know, the significance. Yeah, good I thought point. I, saw, I thought I saw, I read something about that at one point, I think. Uh, maybe I just, it came to me. I don't know, but there might be something more to that. I don't know. Um, as for comments, can you pull them up here? Oh, I just real quick adding uh, the reason that we do the, the the tradition, the whole removing the entire foreskin, this extreme procedure today. Apparently, Jews started doing that in Helen. You dropped out, Angel. Um. Okay, I'm gonna go and read the comments. I guess. Are you guys still there? I'm here. Okay, good. Um. Okay, the comments are. First one says, "Big no." That's Laura Stubbs in, ter in, in response to the uh, in to response to the question or the true false statement. The second person said, um, "Angel, let me know when you get when you come back." Um, the second person says, "Hebrews thirteen eight KJD Jesus Christ the same yesterday 
and today and forever. I'm not sure what what, what the point they're trying to make there, um, because we're not circum. Well, we're we're circumcised by the heart today, and that's the point I was trying to make. Um, second, the third person says it is a witness to his covenant promise and his foreknowledge that the blood of of a child coagulates by the eighth day. Yeah, I think Angel was referring to that. Someone it looks like they wrote in uh, Russian. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, fifth person says, Yogi Bear. Hey, 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 going on. Okay. Um, sixth person says, circumcision, circumcisions are painful. When I got mine right after I was born, I couldn't walk for nearly a year. And I, I think that's a joke. So That was funny. Hendrix. I suspect Hendrix on that one. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Wow. That was pretty funny. I don't think it could have been Hendrix. That was pretty funny. I just got it. <laughs> no, I don't think Hendrix is in the chat room right now, is he? Oh, oh there he is. He's back. He just got back, so maybe that was him. Yeah. Okay, well, Ben, uh, let me make a suggestion. When you're reading the comments, um, just use a little discernment and don't don't read the ones that are yeah, nonsensical. Yeah, Okay, just yeah, read the curious ones. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, oh, I was going to mention one last point. Um, one thing it, it is interesting. Angel said that it, it's becoming a, a, a number. You know, it, it's becoming a a common issue or a pop. It's popular. The issue is becoming more. Uh, I don't know. People are talking about it again, uh, mm -hmm. and that doesn't really surprise me. I, I did see, and I think it's deeply spiritual. Uh, the fact that people again would would I think it's it's really as, as Lisa says so often it's antichrist spirit. You know, it, it's because uh, it, it, it's again, Christ, uh, you know, you need to be born again and, and you, you've got to forsake your flesh and having any merit. And yet these people want to hold on to uh, their earthly members and think it's cruel that, you know, that we, we would chop them off. You know, most like uh, like Christa said, if you cut out your eye or, you know, chop off your arm. So I, I see uh, some parallels there. Also, too, is that, you know, I, I some people are just actually uh, uh, about a year or two ago it was a guy in uh, Times Square with the big sign. And his whole issue was uh, preaching against the cruelty, uh, not not from a biblical perspective at all. In fact, I don't think you I think he was uh, denigrating the Bible and he was just saying how cruel it was for men to be circumcised. And he was uh, advocating against that practice. Like that was his one issue of any issue in the whole world that he wanted to resolve. Uh, that was his issue, you know, and, and he was just being really antagonistic and people he actually got into a fist fight with people. Um, so it, it was very spiritual. Um, well, Ben, see, that's the evil part of it is that because what we call circumcision now, which is it, 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 like basically based on um, a, 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 something that started long after. I mean, it was like in, like I said, around Hel the Hellenistic era, uh, Jews started doing it for some, if some, I don't understand how this would work, but basically the, removing the entire foreskin, like somehow was supposed to conceal that they were circumcised. I, I don't, that's what I read. Basically though, they started doing it. It was not, you know, long, long, you know, uh, time after God ever, you know, first told, uh, told, told them to, you know, to start doing it. It was not, uh, for his, uh, directions at all. And, um, that is what people are freaking out about because you can, you can heap a whole lot more charges against the modern practice of circumcision because it actually does cause, you know, uh, like a, a change in function. Uh, and, you know, it is actually a much more extreme, uh, uh procedure. And, um, uh, that's what they're, that's what they're not really against. They're not actually really against the procedure God, uh, uh, you know, commanded, uh, of the Israelites, which is really, uh, interesting. It's just a complete straw man. Really, because all the arguments they use against circumcision are based on what happens when you remove the entire foreskin. So, uh, and I just found this out. I can't. I can't even believe it. But um, uh, I've never heard anybody bring that up. Which you think they might bring that up? It's kind of important, uh, you know, in this whole in this whole debate. You know that, but what what the Bible said. You know, uh, what, what was biblical circumcision versus? I've never heard that mentioned, uh, which is crazy. Yeah, I don't know what's scarier uh, to be in a world to, to have a world uh, run mostly by people that believe something in the spiritual, but something false and false doctrine, or just live among atheists. I think I'd almost rather live among atheists, and the whole world is turning into this. I see it a, a resurgence of this false uh, spirituality. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I hear that more than atheism. Yes. Me too. That and socialism and communism as well. Well, those, those never left. Uh, the, I mean, remember back in the 50s with McCarthy and all that? I mean, he was, whether you agree with what he did or not, he was trying to expose what he believed to be uh, a rising attitude of uh, communism in, in America. The other word for it is tikkun alam. It's a, Talmud, a Talmudic principle. That is what communism is based off of. Wow. Yep. That's awesome that you know that. That is cool. Well, that is before, cool. We, before we go to the next question, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, we get a lot of interesting questions. Uh, this one is certainly unique. Uh, in, in all the years of my uh, evangelism, I've never heard this brought up as, as an objection and that I had to address. Uh, I, I had, in my own mind, uh, asked myself questions about this, uh, but no one's ever brought it up in an argument against God, um, the way this question was posed. So I, I find it interesting that uh, you're encountering this right now. But I, I do think that there will come a time where you're gonna get some answer, uh, Angel. Uh, you, you had some beautiful insights in the past that I've greatly appreciated. So I, when you do get this uh, uh, understanding from God, then uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it. I guess it, I think yeah. it's time to move to another question, though. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I'll be the circumcision lady. That's, <laughs> that, that's my, <laughs> my expertise. Your claim to fame. <laughs> I never even had a son. Okay, Ben. Are you there, Ben? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yes, uh, next question is true or false. This is uh, Autumn's question, another great one. Grace can be taken advantage of or abused. What can? Great, grace. Oh. Uh, I'm, 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 sure she, I'm assuming she means God's grace. Grace can be taken advantage of or abused. Um, well, I'll, I'll go first. I won't take long, but uh, I believe I have a, a nephew that's done that in his life. Um, he, I, I believe he, he did get saved as a, as a youth, and, and uh, um, I've just, he, he's attended, he's about, uh, say, about 10 years younger than me, maybe more. Uh, no, I think he's about... 13 or 14 years younger than me. Um, he, but he got saved. He moved away from Las Vegas and lived with his uh, in-laws uh, as a kid growing up. And he was raised in the church and long before I ever got saved. Uh, but, but after I got saved, he and I had a lot of talks and he joined my Bible studies and stuff. But uh, it turns out that he ended up getting into drugs and uh, partying to a great extent. I mean, so much more than pretty much anybody I've ever known, uh, far exceeding all my, uh, the height of my evil ways. Um, but he would, uh, I would try to correct him and, and get him uh, on the right track. But, uh, he, and he would actually boast in, in the fact that he, he says he will go into a uh, like a den of what he called crack whores um, and, um, and and engage in that. Uh, and this, as he's doing it, be telling him about Jesus and the gospel. And he thought that was uh, perfectly okay. Um, so uh, I think that there are people, I think that what he did, and there's many other examples we could probably think of where people are uh, uh, take advantage of their grace. And I mean, some may argue that, well, maybe, maybe that person uh, is not saved actually at all. I, we can't know that for sure one way or the other, really. But uh, um, the extent of what people will do and, and to flaunt their grace. Uh, but Paul says, uh, God forbid, that we, we should not be having that attitude. All right, Brother Cripps, why don't you go next? Um, okay. 
I just forgot the question. I'm going to have to look at it again. Oh, there it is. Right in front of me. Um, grace can be taken advantage of or abused. Pretty straightforward. Ah, uh, yes, I think it can. I think it can be. I think your example, Brother Luke, was a pretty good one. Um, in looking at that, I guess the question would be: Does it seem abusive to God? I would think that it did. Um, now, I wouldn't be able to say that that person isn't saved, but I would say that they misunderstand the purpose of grace, as you said. You know what Paul says: God forbid. How can we uh, continue any longer in sin? Um, Grace does abound. That doesn't mean that as a believer, we should just uh, tempt God. I mean, I feel like it's tempting God. It's like saying, oh, can I get away with this? Can I get away with this? And also, it's a child. It's a child's attitude. You know, when you tell a child, don't touch that, and they want to touch it because you said don't touch it, and they don't know that it's for their own good, that you're trying to protect them, for instance, touching a hot stove. Um, it's a child. It, it is a childish attitude. Uh and I do believe it can be abused. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, Ben, you didn't say who uh, wrote the question. Is this also by, uh, uh, who was it that gave us the yeah, question? Autumn. Autumn? Autumn. I, I bet you that, yes. All right, Ben, why don't you go next? Okay. Um, well, I know taking advantage of the term, uh, so the, the question says, or statement says, grace can be taken advantage of or abused. So I know taking advantage of often has a negative connotation, um, but um, it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation. And if it, uh, if you just take that statement at face value, uh, not reading too much in, in it one way or another, uh, I would say God wants us to take advantage of his grace. Um, he loves it when we lean on him and not on our, our own understanding or our own resources. Uh, he loves it when, um, again, we rely on him and his gifts and his grace. Uh, in fact, um, again, this is probably controversial, but I, I don't think it should be. Um, uh, and I, I'm totally convinced of this is that again, Hebrews is, a, I, I believe, a, a warning to those believers, born again believers. Um, like, again, I think I can prove that in multiple ways, not only within the, the chapter itself, but also the Old Testament parallels that it, that it refers to. That it's a, a warning to the a born again believers of falling back, uh, of drawing, uh, of uh, losing confidence in their confession and just drawing back into Judaism, um, turning back, as it were, uh, on a practical level, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can't lose your first birth. birth. Um, but it's a warning for that. And, and one of the warnings it says, that it uses various terms and phrases, but one of the phrases it uses is that, let us, uh, I'm going from memory, so I'm paraphrasing, I guess, uh, let us watch out for one another, lest any of us uh, fall short of the grace of God. And I believe, again, and he makes many, many parallels to the promised land when they're about to take uh, when Joshua and Caleb and their are, are the uh, the new generation that didn't rebel. When they're about to take a, a, go into the promised land, he makes parallels about, you know, those people, certain people didn't go, didn't enter that rest that they weren't. It wasn't that they weren't born again or didn't believe. Uh, in fact, they it said all prior to that says that all Israel worshiped and believed God, um, but they fell they became uh, disbelieving and um, and entering that picture in the Old Testament where they're entering uh, the promised land. is not a picture of heaven as so many people like to think that it is. I believe it's a picture of entering God's daily rest. The land is a picture of God's rest here and now on a practical level in this in a temporally. And uh, and that's I believe what Hebrews is talking about is let's make sure that none of us fall short of the grace of God because they're going to go back into legalism try to earn God's favor that way. And he's saying, no, God's favor is through pe those who, who have believed. And he cites several uh, Old Testament examples of, you know, the Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews 11. Um, and all, all those people uh, were people who were not particularly righteous in their works, but they believe God. And uh, and because they, they uh, exercise their faith uh on various occasions, they were blessed. And, and, and I believe that's, what, again, the whole argument of what Hebrews is about, of people falling short of the grace of God. So God absolutely wants us to, to take advantage of his grace. Can it be abused? Absolutely. Um, how can it be abused? Well, uh, Romans tells us that, you know, should we go on sinning that grace may, may, may abound? It's not a salvation issue. Uh, all, all sin's covered for, but 
you will reap what you sow and you lose rewards and um uh, you, you, uh peace in this life you, you'll lose you, you, what you whatever you know however sin deceives you and think you're getting away with it you're not getting away with anything uh you, you know you're gonna lose out in the next life uh, and you're gonna lose out in this life as well um so it absolutely can be taken advantage of and abused and i would dare say that every one of us does it on a daily basis all right thank you how about you sister lisa Sorry, mute button got stuck. Um, <laughs> Hebrews 4 is what Bim was referring to, where the Lord talks about um, entering into his rest, and we should labor, lest any of us seem to come short of it. Um, <clears throat> and it's talking about labor to get into the rest. But, uh, yeah, I was, well, I, I was a little befuddled on this one because my first question was, whose grace are we talking about? If we're talking about man's grace, yeah, well, certainly that can be abused and misused and everything. And while I do think that, uh, where is it, that it warns about turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, we we mm -hmm. do have to be uh, cautious that the people who are running out there teach, oh, yeah, you can just live any which way you want. Well, you, you can try it. But as I've said before, sin isn't a cursed thing. And Jesus warned, he said, can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? So you're playing with fire and you're going to get burned. So, you know, there is all the liberty in the world, but there's consequence for your actions. So, you know, that's that's the spiritual principle that applies whether you a believer or an unbeliever. Um, but as far as the grace, that's where I wanted to go with Ben touched on, which is he intends for us to grab a hold of that grace and hold on to it for dear life, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, we're supposed to throw ourselves upon him with reckless abandon and trust in that grace and rest in that grace, just like a little baby in their parents' arms when they snuggling them and feeding them and singing to them. They can't do anything for themselves. And that's supposed to be the attitude we have as believers, that we are totally reliant upon the Lord. So, and that our faith and trust is in him for everything, for everything, for, for our daily bread, for our provision, for guidance, for healing, for everything. It's just like that little baby. So, uh, you know, in, in that regard, then no, because that's exactly what he wants. If you're his child and a person had an evil attitude that they were just going to send the grace may about, Get ready for the butt whooping of your life. The Holy Spirit ain't going to miss. He got your number and he ain't going to miss. That's foolishness is folly and you will soon learn it. And you, he will correct that error. So I never worry about when saved people get into that type of error because the Holy Spirit is going to chastise them. If I see them, I'll pray for my beloved brother or sister. They're in error. I'll pray for them if they have that as an attitude. But I'm also not worried. Because God's got their number. That's his child, and he's going to spank their behind. Now, lastly, um, I just wanted to cover, when it comes to people, uh, we have to be cognizant to be led by the Lord so that we don't get abused in trying to extend the agape, the agape love to people. Because some people take your kindness for weakness and they will try to use and abuse you. And that's when we have to be led by the Holy Spirit as to when to say no. Sometimes you have to say no. OK, and, and so that you don't get abused and you don't get used uh, because there are manipulators out there. There are people who have this attitude. They're only about I, my and me. And if they see somebody who's giving and loving and trusting, they may try to exploit you. So on, on that regard, then we have to be led of the Lord. And if even if our heart thinks we want to help, if the Lord is unctioning you not to or to be wise in the way that you assist them then you should hear that so that you don't get used and abused but other than that i don't think i have anything else to say on that matter okay all right thank you great answer sister paula what do you say well not much since everybody really did a great job covering it i mean i think we all agree 
Uh, what was the question? Can grace be taken advantage of? Absolutely. But like Ben was saying, we have a negative connotation when we hear the words take advantage of, but that's what it's for. It's there for us to take advantage of it. The Lord wants us to receive his grace. And in order to do that, we have to really understand that we don't deserve it. Um, so absolutely. That's like asking, can a child take advantage of their parents' grace? And they do all the time. But I think also part of that is human nature. Like those of us who have kids, if you ever take your kids like to a amusement park and then out to dinner and they play for hours and they hang out with their friends, you know what they do on the way home? Where are we going now? Oh, can you stop and get us this? I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, um, it's sort of part of human nature. It's like, yeah, thanks for all the gifts. What else do you have? Mm. Um, that's kind of part of human nature. Uh, the Lord shippers hate it though. They do hate grace because they'll say, yeah, we're saved by grace, but, and then whatever they add their backloading works. It's like, they cannot stop their mouths after yes, we're saved by grace. They hate it. They use terms like hyper grace. Well, grace is hyper. I mean, the grace that covered your paltry sins covered the worst, sickest, most horrible sins in the world also. And that's what the self-righteous cannot get past. They don't want to think that some low life drug user you know, has the same gift that they were given. They can't even, um, or that they were offered, I should say. They can't even fathom it. Um, and like Lisa mentioned, the chastisement. I mean, the chastisement comes, I think, when we do take advantage of the grace that God has given us, when we do live in sin. Now, I would think that if you're living in habitual sin and you continually get chastised, I would think that your conscience would kick in. Uh, the longer I walk with God, the less I sin because uh, he's conforming me to his image, the less it's appealing to me. Um, but you could totally decide not to continue walking with God. But you know what? If you're saved, you're his child and he will chastise you many times over him. He's very long suffering. But at some point, like when my kids act up and I continually correct them, if they don't straighten up at some point, I pick them up and I take them home. It's time to go home. They don't not become my child. I don't leave them there. Like God would never leave us nor forsake us. We're his, whether we're a good kid or a bad kid. But absolutely grace can be taken advantage of. It wouldn't be grace if it couldn't be taken advantage of. But we need to also realize that it's not a negative connotation. It's this beautiful gift that the Lord has given us. And to really sit and meditate on what he had to endure in order to offer us that, I would think um, someone who loves God and is trying to walk with him would um, have some sort of conscious reaction uh, the more they partake in sin. And it sort of um, it makes you see how wonderful the gift of grace is. Well, Amen. well Sister Paula, you're... Uh your real life illustrations were very profound to me. Beautiful um, uh, lessons in that. In that. Uh, uh, Sister Lisa commented that she had something she wanted to add. Yes, I repent. I said I had nothing else to say, but, but I do. Uh, one other quick thing. We didn't define what, what grace is and what we're talking about. Like I did say, it depends on whether or not you're talking about God's grace or our own extended people. That being said, I always like to cite when people talk about grace, if I can, if I remember to, the late Dr. Curtis Hudson's definition, because it to me was the most poignant, the most succinct, and the most accurate. That God's grace, which we know to be unmerited favor, is unmerited favor 
to hell deserving sinners without any expectation of return on the part of the sinner, which ties into what I was saying on how we are as little babies. Remember now the Jesus refers to uh, what transpires by putting faith in him as being born again or what we often term the new birth. Well, we refer to people who just got born again as babes in Christ. So it's the same type of concept, how we are supposed to be totally reliant on his soul sufficiency. And that's just all I wanted to add. Amen. amen. Thank you. Sometimes I say amen before I'm able to mute uh, to unmute, so you miss it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Angel, you didn't uh, answer yet, did you? It's going to be hard to add anything really too much, but what I will say is that, um, well, for one thing, uh, I think what we're really talking about is uh, ingratitude. Um, can we, because I mean, I, I don't think we can help but abuse <laughs> the grace of God. Uh, I, I was even trying to think of another term like, well, so take advantage of, we should take advantage of his, of his grace, but uh, so, so should I say take for granted, but in a way, yeah, we should take it for granted because it is granted to us uh, upon believing. So um, I think the best way to put the spirit of the question is, can, you know, can we um, abuse it, um, on, you know, in an attitude of just um, ingratitude? Uh, and I absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I believe, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, that's that's where the real problem comes in um, is when um, we begin to have a, just a total lack of appreciation because that also make, comes with a lack of humility and a lack of self-awareness and where we're no longer judging righteous judgment, um, and, you know, of our, you know, looking at ourselves um, and really, uh, uh, you know, uh, seeking out those those secret faults. Uh, you know, hoping God will help us, you know, identify those things so that we're not, because those are the, those are the things I fear, you know, those are the, those are the sins that are really uh, concern me are the things I'm totally oblivious to, like some just horrible character flaw that I'm not really aware of, um, that I just, you know, because uh, uh, th those are the ones I've known, you know, in other people that are always the most hurtful. It's not the things that they know they're struggling with, you know, that affect me, Um uh, it, it would be the things that they are, seem oblivious to that they're not even aware are our faults, you know, and that they, maybe they'd be in denial about. Um, and I think that's um, that kind of goes along with um, having a, just a, just not being grateful uh, to, you know, to God's grace and um, actually uh, uh, reveling in it as an occasion to sin, perhaps, which, you know, I've still I still find it to be a very rare thing among, you know, believers where they actually uh, almost like thumb their nose in, in God's face, like, you know, haha, I can do whatever I want because I'm saved. Once they've always saved, you know, now let's go to this, uh, this gay bathhouse. Let's get it on, <laughs> you know, because they can do whatever they want. I've not, I haven't really observed that. I know we had somebody in the chat for a while who was expressing that, but it was, it was so on It was so out of, out of the norm that it was almost hard to believe they really felt that way. Cause it's so, you know, it's not something that we're used to seeing. Um, but I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, what Paula said about, uh, you know, as a, as a parent, that was what I was thinking, too. Um, um, what worries me, like when my children are, um, you know, brats, basically, when when they start to have a real entitled attitude in, in the sense that they don't appreciate um, what I'm doing, which I'm going to do anyway. I'm their mother and I love them. And what my love for them has is not conditional, it has nothing to do with their you know, their behavior, they can't lose my love if they cross a line. Um, but the problem is on for them, um, their character. The problem is, is when if I if I were to allow them to, to be too uh, presumptuous or have too entitled, too spoiled um, to where they, they, they don't they don't show any appreciation and they just there's no limit to what they'll 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 ask or even demand and you know throw fits about um, that's that's gonna harm them if I allow that to go unchecked if I don't correct that behavior um, I have to I have to teach them a lesson not because the consequence could be the loss of my love or their status as my child but um, the the you know what they're gonna grow up to be um, and how their life is gonna suffer as a result of that attitude. Uh, which it absolutely will. So when I see, and that is actually 
my biggest pet peeve is if you know my children uh, start to have that that kind of behavior, that kind of attitude, uh, because I know that that was the biggest problem I had as a kid. I mean, I was just very disrespectful of my family and very I didn't even realize just how not thankful I was, not appreciative, and um, and I didn't uh, I didn't respect them. Like I, I knew that I had their love unconditionally, and I did not, but I did not respect them or see like to recognize just what what incredible people they were and how and how not everybody gets that kind of unconditional love even from their family actually, and um, um, I, I, you know, and I it, it really did lead to like all the problems, <laughs> all the problems in my life, you know, uh, as a, as a young adult uh, really stemmed from that attitude of like like lack of appreciation and um uh entitlement uh although in, in a way yeah i was entitled to their love as my you know as my parents as my family but um it's never a good thing to have that attitude which is why you know even god even god in the flesh jesus christ himself i mean he he did not come here with an attitude of uh entitlement or or he wasn't an egomaniac. He didn't come as like some, you know, king dripping in gold. He came humbly and he demonstrated humility, which shows that even though God has no reason to be humble, like there's a, there's, he has, uh, it's hard to even, it seems like an oxymoron that God has humility, but he demonstrated humility, even in the sense that he, he told us, you know, to, to, he would, he wanted us to reason with him. He will reason with us. He has no reason to have to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, he's God and we're nothing in his, you know, compared to him. But he, it's like, I don't even know another word for it aside from humility. He demonstrates the humility enough to actually try to make us understand things and reason with us and be reasonable. Um, because I think more than anything else is, uh, you know, he's showing us an example. He doesn't want us to have an entitled, arrogant, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, egotistical attitude and i think that that's really the biggest thing when we when we abuse grace is if we're having that attitude where we just don't appreciate kind of like what the israelites you know de demonstrated uh in the wilderness when they were uh kvetching about uh you know about not you know not you know the manna and not that not being good enough and kind of wanting to go back to egypt and stuff after god had you know done so much for them we've seen that repeatedly and you know he he shows us examples of that of, of sort of an ingratitude after after he that you know had had showed them right before their eyes how much he uh, how much how, how he had delivered them miraculously and I think that's a that's kind of a, a warning to all of us it's really just for our own good not not it's not a matter of salvation but uh, as people it, you know we'll really suffer in life if we have that attitude um, brother Luke before we move on. May I read one scripture concerning what Sister Angel just yeah. said about Jesus confirming she's absolutely correct. Okay. Philippians 2, 2, I'll start at verse 5. Uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Thank you. Exactly. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. That cuts deep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I've looked at the chat room uh, on this question, and, and there, I'm really amazed. Uh, there are so many really interesting uh, comments uh, expressed in the chat room. But uh, Ben, uh, did we get any uh, uh, in the uh, poll question yes. you want to cover? Yes. Uh, yeah. First person says, "Whose grace it depends." Um, okay. We we kind of we we uh, addressed that, I believe. And then someone says, Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And Ronald says that, and that was a good, that was a great uh, quote. Um, and the person says, only God knows the heart, so if we're talking about his grace, only he can be the judge of our response to it. That, uh, Laura Stubbs says, they say grace is a license to sin. Another person says, oh, sass, 
but there is a price to pay lost rewards or on earth like prison time. Another person says, I struggle to believe that a true believer who understands the truth of the gospel and is indwelt by the Holy Spirit could or would take advantage of grace. But when your gospel is wrong, I think it's possible. Another person says, the Bible says God will not be mocked, but no matter how righteously we live after we believe we still sin. I don't think any true believer could revel in sin, thus mocking God's grace. Uh, another, another person quotes Jude 1, 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What does this mean? Uh, I, that, that verse is referring to false teachers. Uh, it, there, there's a number of clues. Basically, it, it, this, I'm just commentating on this. Second Peter is a warning saying false teachers are coming and this is what they will offer you this is their false teaching uh they'll deny that we're true apostles they'll they'll deny the lord jesus christ uh and not and like you were uh foreordained to salvation these people are foreordained to condemnation so it's clear to talk about unbelievers being crept in unawares and then jude is really confirmation of that prophecy um in fact, Jude, Peter even says, I'll, I'll make sure you always have a reminder of these things. And sure enough, being faithful as Peter was, as a faithful apostle, uh, he Jude came in and, and uh, confirmed that prophecy that it was actually being actually fulfilled. So those those verses are referring to un, unsaved believers. They never believed. Um, they, they, like Judas, were to fulfill prophecy, essentially. Uh, they stepped into that role as an unbeliever, and they, even though they— had the witness, they were they uh, ate and uh, taught among believers. They were exposed to the truth, but they never believed it. So that uh, don't let that confuse you. The Second Peter and Judah referring to unbelievers. The condemnation is the blackness of darkness forever. Okay, another person says the very nature of God's grace, the grace that Christ provides me, a sinner of all sorts of failure. That grace is what superabounds, so it cannot be taken advantage of. That grace is the love that defines God's patience for his child. And then finally, okay, I won't read the last one. All right, thanks. Uh, now, from those uh, comments that were posted, uh, anybody in the panel want to give answers or responses to any of that? Uh, no. Okay. It's all good. It's all right. Well, we're we're kind of at a point where if I take another question, I'm not sure how if we can get through on our scheduled time or not. But uh, um, we, we have more time than we need to close our thoughts. So why don't we try to answer another question, but try to keep it a little bit concise? Okay. Good. I got it. Okay. I hope this is a brief one. I, I don't. At least my answer will be brief. Um, the question is, and this is my question: the Bible uses quote unquote demon and quote unquote fallen angel synonymously. So in other words, demon and fallen angel are one and the same. True or false? Oh, okay. Um, let me go ahead and answer it. Uh, uh, I say it's, it's uh, false. Um, I would like to say certainly false, but I'm, I'm, I can't come up with these scriptures off the top of my head to, to prove the point. But uh, the, the fallen angels are a particular uh, group of um, uh, class of, of um, beings. And they are, I believe that they are different than the, the class of uh, what are called demons. Uh, but I can't really give you any scriptures to make the point right now off the top of my head. But that's what, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, so I'll answer the question, uh, uh, leaning or false. Okay, Cripps, why don't you go next? Ditto. <laughs> That's what I'll say. I'll say ditto. Uh, I, I agree with the way you characterized it. I I uh, believe that there's a difference between a demon and a, a fallen angel. Uh, they're, they're different ranks. Uh, and um, there are certain, certain ones that have uh, um, different jobs and uh, operations that they do. And uh, yeah, I believe there's definitely a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how about Sister Paula? 
Um, okay, the Bible uses demon and fallen angel. Uh, certainly false. No, I haven't found that to be true at all. Uh, the King James actually doesn't have the word demon. It used the word devils, but it's it's the same thing. Um, the devils, if you read uh, the Bible, are not mentioned uh, in as much as in the Old Testament as though they are in the New. Um, they don't have bodies. They're always looking for a host. They're like a spirit. Um, and the fallen angels are too, I guess. But the angels were creatures that God made. He made them. A third of the angels chose to follow Satan. And at that point, they fell away from God's grace, never to be gotten again. Maybe that's why they hate us because God's so lo long suffering with us and he offers grace to us. They don't have that option for, from what I get from the Bible. They made their decision and they know their fate. Now, the demons, I don't think God made. The demons are the... Um, the fruit of Genesis six, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bear children unto them. Um, this spirit that is, or in these creatures is not the spirit of God. I think that's what these devils are, the, or demons. Um, so I don't think that they were a creation of God. I don't think that they have nearly the power that the fallen angels still have. I think some of the fallen angels were actually um, chained for a mm -hmm. while. If you look at, um, I think it's Jude maybe talking about it. Um, and then some, you know, speculate that maybe the stars are, had something to do with the chained up angels also and the stars fall. Um, but yeah, they're totally different. Uh, creatures. I think the demons, because they're spirit, they can't be destroyed. But I think that they're always looking for a host. That's why they possess people. Now, fallen angels maybe could possess people, but I think they're of a higher rank, definitely. But I think the main point is that God did make all the angels. A third of them uh, turned away from God. But I don't think he made the demons or the devils. That was uh, an un unholy fruit of what happened in before the flood, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Sister Angel, what do you say? Sorry, mute button. Okay. So um, uh, the, can, the question was um, that, it, that they are interchangeable. So like true or false, they are interchangeable or they're they're synonymous. Right. Yeah, um, so leaning, leaning false, but I, I can't, uh, I can't say for sure. Cause I have uh, um, asked myself this question um, before, because like Paul said that, that the word devils is used and um, um, I don't feel that uh, it's confusing to me because sometimes the, the word is kind of used interchangeably. So uh, I do tend to, to, to go with the, the explanation that Paula uh, explained that the, um, the disembodied spirits that we, we call today demons or, or devils, uh, that they are, they are a different category than the fallen angels themselves, which were created directly by God, um, as opposed to offspring uh, of the uh, fallen angels and, and women. Um, per that uh, perspective, that that tends to be how I understand it. So if there is a difference, that would be the difference. Um, but I, I I will say that I'm not totally confident that uh, that my understanding's perfect. Sometimes um, I have questioned whether or not uh, whether or not I'm just kind of reading in too much to it, and maybe somehow they are interchangeable. But um, yeah, I'm leaning I'm leaning false that they are not. Forgot to mute there. All right, thank you. Um, I, Sister Angel, I was expecting you to be the final authority because you are Angel. <laughs> yeah. People have said that's like a, a, a bad, like I've had people say, oh, that's a, that's a, a like a demonic name, uh, you know, like as if, uh, as if it's wrong to, to, to name your child that, but it really just means messenger, uh, yeah. you know, messenger of God, right? So yeah, uh, I think it's a great name. I used to hate it. Hate it. <laughs> all right all right sister lisa what do you say 
Well, I love your name, and you are such an angel. <laughs> I used to get so called devil. <laughs> no, no, I was not. I was not no. always. When I was a kid, I was mean, and so they called me devil instead. You were mean. I was. No, I really was mean. I was a mean, mean kid. <laughs> I was mean. Oh, well, I'm just going by how you are now. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I've been humble. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to say, I'm just going to mess everybody up, but I'm going to do it real quick because we're going to close. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Reiterate the question real quick one more time. So I make sure I start demons, where I want to start. Demons and fallen angels are synonymous. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think if I had to pick a personality that everybody could uh, check out and go see what they had to teach on this. I might look at Chuck Missler would be a good person if you want to get a little bit more. Brother Luke, I'm sure probably has some studies on it somewhere as well that he can refer to. Um, but with regard to uh, angels, angels were actually the sons of God. They are the created sons of God. They beheld the glory of God. And so it's 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 always been taught in exegesis that the reason that they can't be redeemed is they beheld the glory of God, whereas man never did. He has not beheld God in his fullness. The Bible declares no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son of the father, he who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Now, uh, real quick. Also, there's this uh, uh, I, I would tend to agree with Sister Paula that the. Angel, excuse me, the demons or devils are disembodied spirits that were the offspring of the angels, the fallen ones with the women that they took for themselves wives and they produced these giants. Well, when the flood came, the ones that got destroyed, it's argued that those spirits are doomed to roam the earth because they cannot be redeemed and they have not went into judgment yet. So there's right. arguments about that right. as well as the gap theory between uh, Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there are people who argue that there was a pre-Adamite world, that um, when the Bible says, um, uh, the, you know, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, the earth was not form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, they argue that God doesn't make anything void. Why was the earth dark mm -hmm. and, and all these different things and they say that when he says to the man uh and woman uh to be fruitful and mul multiply and replenish the earth that that infers that the earth was plenished before yeah, so it needs to be uh, replenished exactly right. so that there's something went on that we don't know about that god didn't want us to know about right. and so right. that's that, that that's it's, it's complete speculation but there's a theory that that also may be where some of these so-called disembodied spirits came from now and i'll just i'll just leave it at, at that all right fascinating all right, thank you very much. That uh, let me see. Has everybody answered this? Did I miss anybody? Okay. Uh, I while you're talking, uh, Sister Lisa, I just did a search for Chuck Missler on that, and, and yeah, there's. Uh, uh, I think you really nailed it. He he's the right person to go to if you want to learn about this. Uh, uh, so you just. I just put in Chuck Missler, Fallen Angels and Demons, and a whole bunch of videos uh, came up. So uh, as far as I know, he's the one that I'm familiar with also, that probably spoke and taught the most about this that I that I trust. Uh, uh, look, I didn't go yet. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, I go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is my question. Uh, this is also something I've been kind of like not super clear on. It seems confusing to me a little bit. Um, the reason I brought it up is that, you know, I generally uh, have accepted – and I'm not saying I don't accept it any longer. I, I, I just generally probably the, the, the view I would still lean on is that the demons were actually the offspring of the angelic um, incursion in Genesis six, and that the, you know their their offspring were were the demons. However, there are also a peculiar. So that that view, the Bible uh, doesn't really go into uh, any explicit statements about where demons come from. I think most of our understanding comes from. Uh, extra biblical uh, references and cultures, uh, unless of course you, you take Enoch as can canonical. Um, but uh, and I know there's plenty of uh, 
early ancient culture uh, that talked about, um, they have different names for them, like the, uh, the uh, uh, I've got, uh, they call them the Apkalu, is a, a one culture. <laughs> uh, what the name of that culture was, it starts with an A as well. Um, um, anyways, um, uh, uh, Michael Heiser that does a lot of research on this. He, he did a lot of research into the, uh, the ancient cultures. He has a good grasp of all what, what the ancient cultures believed and kind of ties it into what the Bible teaches and, and kind of gives it. He has a good book, a decent book called Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. I would say generally it's a good book, but it does have Calvinistic stuff in there. So don't take it uh, in terms of, you know, your salvific doctrine but he has some interesting things about just the ancient, ancient cultures and what they believed but ju just looking at the bible alone i thought it was interesting is that you know in terms of judgment the bible makes no distinction between the judgment that the angels will receive versus the demons in judgment it says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels and doesn't say anything about demons although man i know that's not conclusive it's just interesting that it doesn't mention anything about that uh and, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says that Paul says that we will judge angels, but not anything about demons. Um, another interesting thing is when Paul, uh, Peter was, uh, gonna, was going to defend Christ uh, in the garden, I believe that was the episode, he, Christ said, don't you know I, I can call a whole legion of angels to fight for me? Uh, so the legion of angels uh, was, in, it was, what, it was a term he used. And then the demons that were cast out of that man in, uh, in, in one of the synoptics in the synoptic gospels, that person, that demonized man said, we are legion. The demon said, we are legion. So again, the legion, I see they both used the word legion. And uh, I mean, I, I, it's easy to say, yes, they're legion of demons, a legion, legion of angels. Um, but perhaps there's something there. Um, Christ says, is Christ is made a little bit lower than the uh, angels. And since believers are going to replace the fallen sons of God, it makes sense that, uh, okay, never mind, that was something else. Um, so again, just looking at scripture alone, it, I don't see it like a, a open and cut, shut case. And in fact, there is a, a word that, um, the, the, another word that the Bible may, may use to refer to these demons, and they call them the Rephaim, and Rephaim apparently means shades. And you'll see that word used in Ezekiel 28, 17. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I I just don't know if there's a there may I know there's definitely an angelic hierarchy, and, and maybe the demons are just a form of the angels. I don't know, but I do believe Judah speaking to the angels that uh, left their first estate, and those those that cohabited with men, those are the ones who are presently in everlasting or they're in chains of darkness, and the ultimately they're going to be placed into the lake of fire, and uh, and and. and uh, well, they ultimately can be placed in the lake of fire, but right now, God temporal they're in a, a temporal judgment, so to speak. They're they're in chains and darkness, but that's not their final resting spot. That's not their final judgment. Their final judgment is uh, the uh, lake of fire. There's something more I wanted to say about this. I can't. Does it come to mind now? So, um, so it's interesting. Is all. I just yeah. want to hear what you guys thought. I didn't have any conclusions. I thought I just want to hear what you guys thought. So, Ben, this is a pen and a notepad maybe you can make some notes while you're so you can remember what you were going to say that's what i have to do ben maybe you no, got you got my drift that you 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 gave some really good examples that i couldn't think of at the time as to why i question um question myself sometimes on this idea um right. really good examples and I, exactly and I, I had more examples and i do take notes copious notes i just didn't I was, in, prepar in preparation for, for the program today, I had to rush. I, I was so try trying to put forth the idea that maybe Ben is finally reaching an age where he's going to have to resort. I absolutely, to I have to, yeah. These methods that I use now, but uh, I'm maybe, nothing without my notes. Maybe he, he's not at that point yet. He's he's still a a young. I'll call him a young pup instead of a young punk. <laughs> <laughs> a young Thanks. pup. Appreciate that. I really, right. I really arrived now. <laughs> um, well, I may I put a comment in the chat room uh, that um, uh, uh, check out videos of Ch Chuck Missler, Fallen Angels and Demons. If you just put that in the search, a um, matter of fact, you got my curiosity I was sparked on this because I know I've seen him teaching on this in the past, but I don't remember much. It's been a long time, but 
uh, I, I think his conclusions, he probably have a very convincing arguments for his position. So that's what I would advise. Um, all right, it's time to say good night and, and give our uh, summary remarks to everybody. So uh, let's start with Sister Angel. All right, yeah, this is a really good discussion tonight. Went by fast. Um, and uh, yeah, I liked, I, we had uh, some questions that were more up my alley tonight, so that was cool. I like, uh, I, I don't know if more people are contributing now that everybody, uh, oh, that you and uh, and Luke uh, twisted their arm bin, but uh, I think that'll, That'll really uh, keep things interesting if people actually commit to uh, to submitting their own true false questions. And uh, Ben's been helping me by re like like I, I have a hard time phrasing things in true and false uh, format. So um, he I tell him generally what I'm what I'm trying to get at, and he he phrases it into a true false statement. So um, anybody out there that has any uh, trouble, uh, maybe uh, even just try submitting it that way, and uh, we can get the gist of it and phrase it properly but um anyway guys uh I, yeah i'm just so glad to refresh now that i've uh, gotten to fellowship with everybody again and uh i guess we'll be uh we'll be uh on tomorrow night for uh for several hours as per usual uh with uh, with sister lisa so uh hope to see some of you guys there all right thank you sister all right. I, I see S Sister Heather has a, a reference to my old age. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I, really, I, I cannot find anybody in the congregation that is my age or older. If you are my old, I'm 69. I'll be 70 in. You're uh, our elder statesman. I in, in, in November, um, I'll be 70 if I live that long. <laughs> but uh, so. Uh, I don't know what I am, elder statesman or not. Yes, I, that's I, right. <laughs> I, uh, I, it would be comforting to me if I found someone else in the chat room who was up at my age or, or greater. But um, uh, so I do have the ability to, uh, I have the right to joke about the age to Ben and others. So, um, all right, let me see. Angel, you made your closing remarks. Let's, let's go with Sister Lisa. What do you have to say? Uh, I was going to say I found somebody in the chat that was about your age, but uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence their name is Methuselah, but no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, <man>. uh, <laughs> I got to uh, in my rib for that one. <laughs> no, Brother Luke, and I, I've told you before, I've said it off air, but uh, since I gave you a little dig, I also wanted to remark uh, truthfully, that uh, you are looking younger and younger. Yes. Uh, you're looking stronger and stronger. And I just wanted to remark on that, how how yeah. good you really do look. I mean, I think you look 10 years younger. I, yeah, I, well, I always I always felt like he, I, I didn't, I was surprised to find out his age because I, I didn't think uh, you looked very old at like, all. And you always talk about yourself like such an old man. I think you held up well. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I, uh, I would have put you in your like 60s, like maybe like, like your early 60s or something. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, You're very nice. Go ahead. But yes, just a reminder for tomorrow night, uh, Late Night with Lisa and Friends starts at uh, 8 p.m. Pacific on my channel, and, which is for the Most High Jesus. And then also it's going to run uh, at 11 p.m. Eastern. I always have to struggle to remember that. Uh, so 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. And then in closing, I just wanted to finish off the scripture that I read that uh, where it talked uh, Jesus humbling himself. It's one of my favorite. It's what I use for my my channel name to justify that uh, Jesus is definitely the most high because I get attacked for that all the time. Uh, it's Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Real quick. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. On that note, 
Hope to see you tomorrow night, late night with Lisa and friends. It's been a wonderful discussion. I learned a lot from you guys. Shout out to everybody on the panel, Sister Paula, Sister Angel, Brother Cripps, and Brother Luke. Thank you again for having me. And good night to everyone out in the chat. God bless. Okay. Amen. Sister Paula, what's your uh, closing remarks? Um, well, it was great as usual. Uh, great true false statements. It was fun. Not that they're not all fun, but I always think we're going to get to a point where we've heard everything and we've gone over everything. But uh, I guess there's just, uh, I think this probably could go on forever when we're talking about God because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so it's really fun to be able to get together with you guys and, and hear how you see God and how you read scripture. It helps me to have a greater understanding of how he shows people different things and what other people see that I kind of just gloss over. I miss, you know, so I just praise God for this fellowship. Um, I did want to apologize to the chat. You guys, if I don't respond to you, I, I'm sorry. It's very hard for me to concentrate on what's going on in the chat and also listen to what everybody's saying. Um, but Nongo is in there. And there was something that he had said that I meant to, I tried to type it in there. I'm not real good at doing that quickly. And I, it's too far up, so I can't go back and see it. But it was something to the effect of that from what I understand from what he wrote in the chat that he grew up lordship, but now he knows it's uh, by grace through faith alone. But then he did say some sort of comment that uh, made me pause for a minute, something about he hasn't set sin aside yet or something like that. And I just want to say, um, Nongo, none of us have. None of us have. We can't possibly. And that's why Jesus had to die. But it bothers me when I hear people so focused on their own sin, because when you're focused on yourself, guess who you're not focused on? <laughs> God. And yes, sinning's wrong. Yes, he wants us to not sin. But you also have to understand that um, this is why the uh, Lordshippers hate grace. They hate it because we understand that Jesus, he died for our sins. But when you really, truly get that, you can rest and accept the fact that you're never going to be perfect. Only through God could you ever be perfected. And we will be one day when our bodies are resurrected. But while we still live in the flesh, we can't possibly stop our sinning. He knows that. That's why he died for us. Now, the Lord shippers want to say, oh, so you're saying that you can just do whatever you want and you're still saved. Yes. Yes. But the difference is I don't want to do the same things I used to want to do. That's the difference. If there's no difference from who you used to be and who you are now, maybe you're not a new creature yet. If there is no rest to you, if there is no peace in your heart about certain things, you're still struggling to enter into the rest. The Bible says that we labor to enter into the rest. It's difficult to get it into our minds and our hearts that we literally can't do anything to please God. We just believe in what he has done. And, you know, all these other things pop into our head. And I, I, I strongly encourage you to go to God with every single question that you have. Uh, the Lord says, come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. When I first read that, I was like, you want me to argue with you about this stuff? Yes, he does. If you have a problem with something, he wants you to come to him and ask him. He's the one who gives us understanding. He gives us the knowledge, which is his word, but we can use our own understanding or get understanding from other men and it's not going to be from God. Let's go to God and say, what does this mean? And allow him to show you in his word what he means and he'll do it in a way that brings you so much peace i want to um 
mention this verse, Isaiah 32, 17 says, and the work of righteousness, that's Christ's righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. That's the effect. The cause is getting the righteousness of Christ. And we only do that by trusting that what he has done has been sufficient for a holy God. We have to get to the point to say, okay, I accept that what you did is the only way. There's nothing I can do. It takes a humongous burden off yourself and you find yourself not focusing on you and your sin not as much you focus on the Lord because you gain a greater understanding of what he has done for you. And uh, I'll be praying for you, Nongo. I'll be praying for your family members. Also, he was wanting us to talk about our family members and the fact that, you know, how do we deal with the fact that they don't believe and they're going to hell? What I, I always think of is it ain't over till the fat lady sings. They still have time. If there is air in their lungs, they still have time. And prayer is the greatest thing that you can do for them. Prayer works miracles, I'm telling you. So don't give up hope. And all these fears and worries that you have, take them to God. Ask him, just say, Lord, take this from me. He will show you a way to deal with it. And ask him for greater understanding of what this means, this whole thing of salvation. You know, he said, you, you have not because you ask not. Ask him. Say, Lord, please make this clear to me to where I can understand it. And he will. I promise you he will. So uh, with that, I'll say it's been a great Friday as usual. I love this. This is my favorite day of the week because of you guys. And a Saturday is my second favorite day of the week because I love Lisa's broadcast. Uh, you guys should all join us in the chat. It's really fun over there. And uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. Sister Paula, you're starting to turn into a preacher. <laughs> the, the mood strikes every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Brother Cripps, what's your summary remarks? Yeah, another great uh, fun Fellowship Friday. I love the uh, questions. Uh, uh, we had a couple of di different ones, but uh, I love that they'll, those come along from time to time. And I hope that uh, Angel, that uh, bring up that question is going to help uh, with your purpose. Um, it's a fascinating thing that people are interested in that. But uh, like I said, uh, I think everyone's answer was uh, pretty good to that one. Yes. Well, and the reason it is, is nobody's heard of it already. I think the reason it's so, it seems like such a strange question is that it seems like it's only, it's a pretty recent thing that yeah. there's this like campaign against the procedure. So I think that's why, as Christians, we haven't ever had to really answer to yeah. that charge yet. But uh, it, I, that's why I thought it'd be good to address it now because right. it's getting more and more popular. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So had a had a fun time as usual, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. And looking forward to next Friday. Thanks, Brother Cripps. How much fun did you have? I had I had too much fun. I don't know what to do with myself. It was it was too much. <laughs> did, you, did you get actually get a little giddy? I'm I'm usually always pretty giddy, but yes, I've actually been giddy all day because looking forward to the fun fellowship Friday. All right. I wanted to ask everybody in their closing remarks how much fun you had tonight. Mm -hmm. God. All right, Brother Ben, well, and you tell me how much fun did you have and, and tell me your your summary. I had a lot of fun as usual and um and uh, parts of that's due to the the great questions we've, we've been getting. I, I liked all of them tonight. Um, Heather Bridgman gave us a bunch. Um, and uh, Autumn gave us a bunch. Um, and a few others that, that uh, from various people. And so they were great. And I would encourage everyone to submit more. Uh, for anyone, again, anyone who's concerned about, uh, you know, their sin, uh, again, God wants, God died for the whole world's sin, even for false teachers and unbelievers. He died for everyone's sin. All sin that was ever conceived or uh, contemplated by any person who ever lived, God died for it. Christ died for it. And he wants you to have th that salvation. He's obligated. If you believe in, if you believe he died for your sin, he's obligated to give it to you. There's no one who, who believes that who who's not going to receive that righteousness as a free gift. God's obligated himself. And if, 
if he breaks his promise, then we got way bigger problems than uh, <laughs> than uh, hell. I, I think. Um, so, also, I, I okay. I wanted to read the uh, comments because there's some good ones on that last question, real quick. So I'll make I'll be quick. Uh, Laura said, um, regards to the uh, demons and false uh, or fallen angels. She says probably, but I don't know for sure. In other words, are they the same? She says uh, probably, but I don't know for sure. Um, another person says, uh, I believe the fallen angels were the fathers of the Nephilim and that the demons or evil spirits are the disembodied Nephilim. And I think that's pretty much the common view uh, uh, among all of us. But this is an interesting thought. Um, I'm not sure it was articulated as well as it probably could have been, but someone says Lucifer eroded into Satan. So why not fallen angels eroded into demons? And I, I, that's a thought that I occurred to as well. Not not that eroded per se, but that God gave them a different title because they became a different type of uh, being, essentially. Like Satan. Very was, good point. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So Lucifer, I guess, is pre-fallen state. Satan is his fallen state. Fallen angels, that's, that's their pre-fallen way of saying it. And then they became demons after they fell. I, I don't know. That's but that's perhaps a, as a punishment too, because um, the, some at least in some traditions, the idea is that the angels fell in part because when they 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 incarnated, they were overcome by the temptation of the flesh, and um, they chose it over over godliness, over serving God. And if he were to disembody them. Uh, for the duration of their time, you know, before the judgment, that would be, uh, that would be, you know, a punishment. Uh, that's a, that's a thought. Yes. And it would also be in, it'd be consistent with the idea that law, the effect the, the, the offense or the uh, punishment is, is related to the offense. Um, yeah. So they want to become flesh. Oh, you want to become flesh. Huh? Okay. Well, you, you now you, you, you become subject to it. All, all the, uh, the good and the bad of the flesh, which is really not any good. It's just bad. Um, okay. So the last comment is, I think the demons The lust are, of the flesh without any ability to fulfill those lusts because they don't have a body. Yeah. And plus the flesh doesn't go on forever, you know? So, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. So I, I think the demons, this is the last person says, I think the demons are the disembodied spirits of the dead hybrid giants and Nephilim. Fallen angels are the spiritual rulers of the kingdom of the spiritual realms on earth. They are bound in Tartarus. So, um, so anyways, yeah, great, great to fellowship tonight and, um, looking forward to tomorrow's program and, uh, thanks for allowing me to participate again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, brother. Uh, well, uh, I'm thankful that, uh, uh, more people are uh, beginning to submit some questions. It takes some of the stress and off of me and, and also from, from Ben to have to come up with some questions. So please keep doing that. Come up. I mean, all you need to do is just make a statement and, and say, is this true or false? Uh, and and uh, there were some fascinating questions tonight. Uh, one in particular that uh, was really unique. I never thought we'd be discussing, but it was very interesting. But thank you, uh, congregation, for joining us tonight, and thank you, everybody on the on the panel. As usual, we uh, we, we all love this Friday night fellowship. We decided to call it Fun Fellowship Friday because really we do have so much fun every Friday, and we know how much we all look forward to it. So it didn't disappoint me tonight. I had a great time with all of you. Um, so join the. Uh, Sister Lisa's channel uh, for the Most High Jesus uh, tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern for uh, Lisa and friends. And then don't forget to join us Sunday for our Church of the Eternally Secure uh, Sunday Church service. That's 5 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>